Welcome to day two of EBP 2021, the Inter International Conference on Evidence-Based Policing that Cambridge University has sponsored uh, continuously since 2008 uh, against many challenges, including COVID and including uh, this morning uh, encoding of the slides that Chief Constable Vaughan is going to present. Um, but what I'm hoping to do is uh, first uh, begin the conference by introducing the first chair of the morning, uh, and that is uh, Dr. Jacqueline Sabir, who is the Assistant Chief Constable of uh, Bedfordshire, uh, working with uh, Hertfordshire, Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire uh, on specialist operations, and she is currently uh, the National Police Chief's Council lead on serious violence reduction. Please welcome Jacqueline Sabir. Thank you, Professor, and good morning, everyone here at Cambridge, and good morning, everybody online. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, chair this session this morning. Um, as the National Police Chief's lead for serious violence, what has been really different and remarkable about how we're addressing this rise is the use of evidence-based policing and looking at what works, testing all sorts of different initiatives, from violence reduction units to hotspot policing, and how we do some very traditional and contentious techniques differently. And that's what you're going to hear about this morning. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Chief Constable James Vaughan from Dorset Police to talk about a different approach to stop search and how we measure things, a very courageous approach, if I may say so. And as a former alumni of the, um, of the programme, of the Masters programme, it just will hopefully inspire you to think differently and look at what you can do when you take a different approach. So Chief Constable, may I welcome you to the stage? The, the title of the presentation is Disproportionality in Dorset. And you might ask, why Dorset? We heard yesterday from Simon around Crick's continual search of the question why. Um, well, what, and I, I, what I wanted to do is to set out some context and give you an explanation as to why Dorset um, is an area that focuses heavily on stop and search, not, not what you might imagine is the most um, typical place that these kind of problems would would, would, have, would arise. Dorset is a small, rural, beautiful county police force, um, famous for the Jurassic Coast. Um, we have 80 miles of beautiful um, coastline, um, but we do have a city-sized conurbation um, of nearly 450,000 people, a city by the sea um, in Bournemouth Pool in Christchurch. Um, with, a, with a population of three quarters of a million people across the county. We are a police force that is graded by HMIC as good across the board, 10 out of 10 grades of good, often described as a sort of John Lewis brand in policing, a top 10 performer in just about every measure that we currently have, and I, and I hope with the new measures that we see coming from government. So it's a, it's a good, solid strong performing police force. Uh, we are currently third in the country um, when it comes to trust and confidence. So the communities in Dorset have very, very high trust and confidence in the force. And we enjoy one of the lowest crime rates in the country. So it's a surprise to me, and it has been, it would be a surprise to you to learn that Dorset has, in Dorset, you're 22 times more likely to be stopped and searched if you're black than if you're white. Uh, and that makes us an outlier against national data by, and excuse the pun, a country mile. The national average sitting somewhere around eight or, or, or times more likely. And actually, we're probably pushing that average up by um, being so high. And there's nothing, and I've been in Dorset for 10 years, there's not much about Dorset that I don't know. I lived there, I've worked there for 10 years, I've been a chief officer from ACC through to Chief Constable. And I'm puzzled and have been puzzled for 10 years as to why that's the case. So for me, there's, there's, I'll talk in a moment about some hypotheses. But either we've got a very sinister, serious underlying problem of prejudice and discrimination, or there is a problem with the data. And I'm going to just explore with you some of those hypotheses and some of the um, 
some of the findings we've had. It's not a, it's not a conclusion. Um, some of the findings and why, therefore, we feel it's necessary for a small county force like Dorset to be a national and potentially a global leader in bringing about new research to look at this problem. In the context, as Jackie has said, of reducing serious violence, which is our primary aim. So a couple of other facts about Dorset. Um, we, we have a resident population of 750,000 people. Um, and the weekend before last, we had 500,000 people on our beaches, even though it was raining. So on high days and holidays, we can expect to double the size of the population in Dorset. And that's just something to, to, to think about. I've recognised as the Chief Constable of Dorset that we absolutely need to face this issue of disproportionality. Not only does it undermine um, and erode the trust of black communities in Dorset and elsewhere, um, it goes to the very heart of the, the legitimacy issue that we were discussing yesterday. Um, we have got a problem. However we understand it, there is a significant problem with disproportionality and disparity, both in policing and elsewhere in the criminal justice service. One of the things that I've learned over 30 years of policing around managing um, police performance and driving um, change is you have to have a forensic and detailed understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve. And around stop and search disproportionality, we are a million miles away from a forensic understanding of the issue. And without being critical to colleagues in the ONS, but the ONS measure uh, of disproportionality based against resident populations is leaves Dorset Police with a chronically skewed picture. And it's also worthy of saying that um, it's very difficult as a chief police officer and a white middle-aged um, chief police officer to talk about disproportionality of stop search and other tactics without in some way appearing or being perceived as being defensive. And, I, and I've, I've said to uh, my colleagues, and I say to anybody that will stand still long enough to listen, that we, we have adopted the most open and transparent um, view of disproportionality in Dorset that I've seen for some time. We are, and we keep a very, very open mind as to what, the, what lies behind the problem. I just want to talk briefly about data integrity. Um, and I don't really need to persuade a, a room for and a conference for the people on an evidence-based policing conference about the importance of accurate data. The data integrity around stop and search is vital. We have a problem nationally that only eight, somewhere between 85 and 89% of stop search ethnicity is recorded on stop and search forms. And I learned of that in Dorset when I found that 87% of my stop and search records were not compliant with basic details around ethnicity. Um, I did what most chiefs do, which is deploy a grumpy DCI to look at every single form and put a zero tolerance regime around compliance. Because how does it look, how does it look to our communities when um, we have a problem with disproportionality and officers don't record the ethnicity of people they're stopping and searching. What, what will people, what would the cynical onlooker think? And of course there's understandable and legitimate suspicion bred into just not seeing accurate data. So we've moved to 99.5% compliance on accuracy of completing the data in Dorset through deploying a grumpy DCI to look at every single record, which I suppose is the preserve of a small rural county force. Um, and what we found was the missing data wasn't um, missing black stop searches, it was missing white searches. So having data right, so the, the opposite to the, the hypotheses was that officers were failing to record in all, you know, potentially to under, under sell, uh, put a different slant on the level of stop and searches against black people in the county but they were white stop searches that were missing. We've made some progress. We've, we've, we've trained our entire workforce in unconscious bias 
the use of other tactics to tackle serious violence. We've shaped our control strategy to move away from simple possession and pursuing drugs other than early intervention around the drugs problem. And we've begun to see some of the disproportionality rates fall over, over the last four quarters. It's gone from 22 times more likely to be stopped searched uh, in quarter three, it was down 14.9. Then, of course, in quarter four, we had a county lines operation. Um, very, very good intelligence led. We made a number of arrests and did a day of action during the intensification week. And disproportionality in Dorset for that quarter went back up to 23.1. Again, an alarming figure. Um, and I continued to ask why. I've, I've placed five. Um, key hypotheses around why disproportionality in Dorset is a national outlier. The first one is we're, uh, there is an, uh, uh, an inappropriate and unlawful use of stop search in too, too many um, occasions. That's the first hypothesis, and I keep an open mind on that. Two um, is that I have officer discrimination. Prejudice, um, covert prejudice, is being translated into discrimination. That's an, an open hypothesis that I continue to explore. Um, that our census data is so grossly inaccurate that it, it skews the figures is hypothesis three. That we are a net importer of high harm criminality into Dorset. And there's a fairly unique relationship between us, the Midlands, and London. Good rail networks a very, very prosperous um, area of the country. Why wouldn't you come to Bournemouth to live and work where there's low-cost housing, high-value jobs, prosperity, um, and, and a beautiful place to live? Um, but we do, so we import, um, we, we, we've got domestic migration into Bournemouth because of high housing costs in London and elsewhere. Um, and with that, we also import some degree of high-harm criminality. And then you add to that the visitor population, um, 500. There will probably be 500,000 people on Bournemouth and Paul Beach this weekend. And those people are people that come from cities and they will, they will represent the demographic of the places from which they come rather than the demographic of the place of which they visit. Again, you can start seeing a pattern of how data can skew, skew things quite um, alarmingly. So when we've looked at unlawful or inappropriate use of stop search, um, we, we've looked, there is a fairly intensive and enhanced um, audit regime in place. So first of all, the HMIC, as you can imagine, um, in order for us to maintain a good legitimacy group, they have taken a huge interest in understanding the legitimate use of the tactic and have conducted, like many forces, fairly intense audits of stop and search. And they found very high percentages of compliance. The grounds for search, the lawful use of search, overwhelmingly is, is good. They're not finding evidence that the, the, the power is being inappropriately used or disproportionate to the threat. So there's that. There's the... Um, I wasn't content with that. I've conducted, and again, this is the preserve of a small police force. I, I've conducted a personal audit of the last 100 black stop and searches in the county. So I could be personally reassured that the grounds and the lawfulness of those searches um, were as I was being told by the HMIC. And again, that further confirmed that the use of the tactic was at least lawful um, and the grounds were, were, were good. We have also have a, a scrutiny panel, as you would imagine, led by the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner, where we look more routinely at stop and search across the whole population. But there is a focus, because we are an outlier on, on stop, and search, stop and searches of black people. And the scrutiny panel look at every single black stop and search in the county. And not only do they look at everyone, they look at the body-worn video that's been used um, alongside. And again, they give, they give us a very, very clean bill of health in terms of the appropriateness, the lawfulness, and the way in which stop search is conducted in Dorset. 
high levels of politeness, high levels of, of professionalism. Um, we've set up a, a, a Deputy Chief Constable-led Disproportionality and Disparity Board, which has now infected our local Criminal Justice Board, and the whole of the Wessex region are beginning to look at disproportionality and disparity across the criminal justice system in a more, more forensic way. So I'm not seeing um, um, evidence of over inappropriate or unlawful use of stop and search. Now, I uh, just hold that thought about over because where discrimination exists, it doesn't exist in clear sight, in policing in particular, because the regime, um, the, the conduct regime, is one of zero tolerance when it comes to discrimination and prejudice. So, officer discrimination. We, we do reflect um, the communities that we serve um, in Dorset, um, and I remain completely open-minded that among the 2,600 people that work in Dorset, some of those will harbour prejudice, and some of those will um, allow that to be translated into discriminatory behaviour. But it will be very, very covert. It will be hidden from sight. And therefore, how do, how do we, as, as police officers, as chief police officers, understand and get to the heart of that? And we've done some work with that too. Um, like most forces, we've trained the entire workforce twice now in areas of understanding um, racial bias in particular, but unconscious bias across the, the piece. Um, we've identified a group of officers that have a high intensity of use of stop search and disproportionality of their stop search stands out, a small handful. Now that could mean that those officers are harboring covert um, prejudice and are exercising discrimination, or it could mean those officers are courageous frontline um, officers that are working hard to combat violence in our communities on behalf of the communities. But no, nonetheless, when you have that data, you then need to compare that data to other information you hold about officers, what clubs do they belong to, what does their discipline record look like, what was on their application, what organisations do they support, um, etc. And you can and should build a picture to see if you can identify officers that may, that may have, at best, um, ingrained unconscious bias, or at worst, prejudice and discri discrimination. We, like most forces, exercise zero tolerance in our misconduct proceedings. Um, we have, you know, as we all know with the Uplift programme, the screening on recruitment to try and find prejudice is fairly, fairly robust. And we're making very good progress in Dorset um, with the increased representation of our workforce. We're on target virtually on target on recruitment to recruit more black, Asian, minority, ethnic people into the force. So again, there's no hard evidence or no, no real evidence to suggest that the 22 times is that at the heart of that there is an underlying current of prejudice and discrimination, albeit, as I said at the start, I remain very, very open-minded to it. So it brings us to in the inaccuracies of census data. So first of all, we know the census has just been redone. It's done every 10 years and, uh, on the anniversary, um, and it's done in 2021. Um, it, it does a very crude calculation measuring stop in, the number of stop and searches of black people against the resident population of black people locally. Um, that, I say it's a crude measure, and it's crude and it's fragile in a number of ways. First of all, it's now 10 years out of date. and we, I know from our research that there's been an exploding population and shift of demographic in Dorset, a 250% increase over the 2001-2011 census data, albeit inaccurate. But even that data showed a 250% increase in black and Asian minority ethnic communities um, in Dorset. And that, we, we've made the assumption would have, would have, would have continued, we made more than an assumption, I'll show you some evidence in a moment, that that continued and accelerated over the next 10 years. And not only that, the data when it was collected in 2011 missed thousands of people that were not recorded as living 
or working or obtaining services in Dorset. So our census data is chronically out of, out of um, kilter. The, the census data in Dorset suggests that only 0.5% of the population are black. The, we, we've bought some commercial data, we've worked with Fraser Nash, we've gone to schools data, health data, commercially available data. And we expect, first of all, they've undershot our population by about 30 or 40,000 people that are buying products, using schools, using the health systems, um, but not shown on the census data. Um, and when you look at that data more carefully, actually 1.3% of the population of Dorset are black and overall with, with Asian and other groups, our, our ethnicity is nearer 8%, not 4%. Now, when you take that and the visitor population, you begin to see how we can be such an outlier. So with the, with the new um, Beacon Dodsworth data, or P2 data, that we've collected using Fraser Nash, um, we, we've shifted an, our understanding of the resident population um, to a point where we now believe that only 92% of the county is white and about 8% is black, Asian, minority or other. And when you apply just that simple calculation against accurate um, population data, in a fairly unique part of the UK, central south coast, proximity to London, good transport net networks, economic um, opportunities, domestic migration, certainly for, especially for lower skilled workers who, who can't afford housing in London. Um, you, you can see that even just applying that one measure reduces disproportionality from 22 times to eight times. Uh, probably a more reliable method. Still a chronic problem in line with national av uh, average. Uh, we still have a chronic problem to solve. But, but before you start trying to solve a chronic problem, you still need a forensic understanding of it. So we look further. And um, what else is um, unique, not unique, or what other factors stand out for Dorset? Well, we've all, we all are trying really hard and doing our absolute best to tackle county lines criminality. Very, very high levels of violence being exported out, mainly London and other big cities, uh, using the exploitation of young people to come to places like Dorset, Bournemouth, Weymouth, Paul, to um, trade in the, the market of drugs and violence. We are a, a, a national outlier and a net importer of county lines criminality into the county. We have a 140 vulnerable premises and vulnerable people mapped to try and target Harden against it and more than a hundred young people from out of uh, out of the county most of them young vulnerable black men between the ages of 16 and 70 that come to Dorset often debt bound trafficked as we heard from Sarah yesterday uh, in, in fairly desperate circumstances coming to Dorset um, to work their debt or to and but nonetheless, there was a, we, we, every weekend, every single weekend in Dorset, a sleepy, low crime, John Lewis Brown police force, we have a very, very nasty, near fatal stabbing almost every weekend. And it, 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 sometimes Bournemouth is more reminiscent of a difficult South London borough than a sleepy, blue rinse seaside resort. So it's. It really is a problem, and we all know how much energy we're all putting into solving this problem, both to um, prevent and safeguard young people. The thing, the, the thing I really don't sleep, the, the thing I lose sleep over most is worrying about waking up to find that a 16-year-old boy has been stabbed to death in the gardens in Bournemouth. And that's a, a real and present danger and a threat that we need to tackle. So, when we looked at our stop in search, um, we, we, we discovered that um, somewhere in the region of 20% of the stop in searches conducted in Dorset. And let me just give you some factoids about the number of stop in searches, um, certainly for those who understand the national data sets. 
in 2012, um, we conducted about 8,000 stop and searches in total in the county. Um, through various initiatives, various drives, various um, looks at this, um, we used best use of stop search one, best use of stop search two. By last year, we were, use, we were using 2,000, 25% of the stop and searches. It, it tumbled to a very, very low level use. And of, of those 2,000 stop searches, 166 of those searches last year were of black people which gives us this figure against the resident population. So it gives you a bit of context about how the, number, the small numbers can be skewed. Um, I know there's a couple of people in the room that live in the beautiful Purbeck Hills. And for those who don't know the area, if you come to Dorset, you can go on holiday to Durdle Door, Lulworth Cove, the Jurassic Park Coast, that gorgeous part of the countryside is called Purbeck. And in that area, on population day, to 40 people um, there are 40 black people live there. And last year we stopped one car with two lads from London um, who'd been involved in a serious incident in London that morning linked to County of Orange Criminality. They were stopped and searched and eventually arrested in Purbeck. And Purbeck, as a result, because of the resident population, now has you're 40 times more likely to be stopped and searched in Purbeck um, if you're black than if you're white. So these are my... my Theses, if you like, my hypothesis is that these, this is a crazy way to measure a serious problem. And it skews it. Um, and it creates a narrative which takes, takes, us off, I've heard, takes us off in a direction that doesn't help us get to solve the real problem. And actually, do we actually understand the extent of the real problem? So, of the 20% of searches that we conduct in Dorset, um, of all the searches, 20% of them are for people that don't live in Dorset. And of the 20% of people stop and searched in Dorset that are not from Dorset, 61% of those are young black men. And that links to the intelligence picture um, that I've talked about around county lines. The find rate in Dorset is much higher than anywhere else in the country. The average find rate in the country is about 20%. We're averaging nearly 30% in terms of our fine rates. So now you have a couple of really difficult factors that are skewing the picture. You've got this resident population calculation against the true population is one thing. You have a, we have a particular problem with travelling criminality. And the people that were stopping search and bringing that criminality don't live in Dorset. When you add those things, if you were to take away the stop searches of black people that come to Dorset, uh, that don't live in Dorset, um, you're down to, against resident population, about three times more likely. Well, that's the problem that needs to be solved for us. And with that, rather than um, the narrative around 22 times, which is a distraction because it's not true and it's, and it's unhelpful, we're now at the point where we want to try and tackle why have we got disproportionality at three times more likely. That's still something very difficult for me to explain and justify to the communities that I serve in Dorset. So what then? Um, this remains a chronic, a chronic issue of fairness and equality set in a global context of policing legitimacy and a crisis in policing legitimacy. And um, you, you, and you, could, you could become philosophical and begin to think, therefore, um, you could sort of look at Hippocrates and think about whether the greater harm being caused, the hurt to the unfairness caused by stop, stop search is a greater harm than the violence you're trying to prevent. I'm not going to try and tempt that debate today, but it, those are the kind of questions we have to have. Um, which brings me on to, Professor Sherman's going to talk to you in some detail about some new approaches that we want to take and we want to lead in Dorset. Because we lead as an outlier, we feel, I feel there's a professional and moral obligation for me as a chief counsel and us as a police force to lead some, some new research to, to tackle violence which doesn't allow, doesn't get distracted by um, a narrative around an issue which is hugely, um, mag it's, it's hugely exploded into out of proportion. 
um, which means we're not actually dealing with the problem. So could we, uh, could we employ evidence-based policing? Well, we know that there is some global evidence that stopping search can be effective against violence. The evidence is less clear against things such as drugs. But we know that stopping search can be used in the right context an effective tool in reducing violence. And we must, mustn't take our, our focus off of reducing serious violence. We need to think carefully around places like Dor why Dorset is such a, a great place to do a new trial is that Dorset has about just under 500 lower super output areas. Um, of those, Simon Cole mentioned yesterday around how um, violence can be concentrated in tiny proportions of, of areas. Well, in Dorset, um, as, as Professor Sermon will go through shortly, the, the vast majority of our serious violence is, is limited to a very small number of those lower super output areas. So there is a, a new hypothesis for me that I'm, I think we are over-policing vast the vast parts of our county. The use of stopping search tactics in Purbeck cannot really be justified. There is no high harm in Purbeck. Now, the worst scandal in Purbeck is teenagers jumping off of the doodle door arches. So um, we need a different approach. We, and, and we need to begin to look at victimisation, disproportionality and victimisation. When we begin to look at data around young black men and their, their likelihood of being the victims of serious violence, and you then focus that in some hotspots in places like Dorset, in some of the high harm areas of Dorset, there's some interesting thinking that we're doing to try and understand a, a different way of tackling violence in those areas. I'm not saying um, that we're going to adopt a policy of withdrawing stop and search from low harm areas, but uh, I'm really interested in an RCT that concentrates stop and search and other tactics to, that, and evidence-based tactics that reduce violence into the areas that really, really have a problem, particularly where there's high victimisation and disproportionate victimisation of young black men. So I, I don't want to steal um, Professor Sherman's thunder, but um, I, 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 I conclude by saying that the, I, I think some of the work that we've done to understand data in Dorset helps us focus on the true problem. We, we think there is a, 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 a chronic um, fairness and equality issue around stop and search. We think it's unfairly and unhelpfully reported in OS stats, which mean little or nothing, um, and are just a distraction. And we think there is generally a, different, a better and different way to gather evidence, um, run a, a, some experimental criminology in some high harm areas in places like Dorset. I'd be delighted if we can extend the, uh, the RCT beyond Dorset and use some controls as well. But Dorset is where, where we're going to start with that. And uh, I look forward to hearing from Professor Sherman on the, the risk of just disparity index, which you're going to hear all about in a moment. So again, you, you can see the approach that it's looking at a problem differently and looking at the data. And as your students will all know, it's all about the data, isn't it? So I'd like to introduce a man that needs no introduction, really, um, Professor Ch Sherman, to talk about the, the risk disparity index and this new approach to uh, measuring stop search disproportionality. Professor. Thank you, Dr. Sabir. I'm greatly... Uh, uh, Proud of the fact that we have Police Minister Kit Malthouse with us this morning, as, as well as uh, National CT Commander Neil Basu. And uh, I'm not going to go very long uh, with respect to the issues that uh, Chief Constable Vaughan has so eloquently and comprehensively stated. Um, I, I just want to summarize a, a few key points coming out of the work that Dorset uh, uh, undertook with Cambridge uh, a year ago. And that um, uh, took us 
uh, in the same direction that the United States National Academy of Sciences laid out in its 2004 report on the fairness and effectiveness of policing, in which it roundly condemned the use of resident population as a standard for computing any rates of policing when, in fact, the policing engagement in street visible offenses requires an understanding of the street population, first of all, which is very different from the resident population, which includes uh, lots of people at uh, the high and low ends of the age spectrum who are not out on the streets and certainly not at high crime times. But to go beyond that, we have the uh, very strong evidence that victimization and offending are highly overlapping. A uh, number of recent studies uh, in the UK, including the Leicestershire one you heard about last night in this conference from Simon Cole, um, makes us aware of the fact that if we're doing stop and search, it's not just because it's potential offenders, but it's also because the people being stopped and searched uh, on legal grounds are potential victims. And that if we think in terms of what we're trying to do, we're trying to reduce victimization by serious violent crime. And it's that reduction in victimization that is the standard by which the policing actions should be judged. You could argue that the disparity in homicide rates for blacks, which is nationally running about four to five times higher than for whites in England and Wales, is the number one problem. That's where the most harm is found. And that to give far more attention to the disparity in stop and search without even taking the disparity in violent victimization into account is a way of creating a misleading and misguided framework for assessing police performance. So what we have developed in collaboration with Dorset, analyzing their stop and search by race across 452 lower super output areas, but also looking at violent victimizations by what the ONS calls the, the serious uh, violent crimes, uh, which include murder, GBH, rape, robbery, uh, assaults, and other offenses of great seriousness. Those offenses are indeed heavily concentrated in a small number of the areas of Dorset. Um, and what uh, we are planning to do now with uh, one of our MST students entering his thesis year uh, from Dorset Police is to develop uh, a trial that's never been conducted in Britain before. It is a direct trial, not of stop and search, but of stop and search in serious violence hotspots. And part of the premise is that the uh, benefit of stop and search in violent hotspots is well established in nine out of nine trials in the United States, mostly focused on guns. And Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Talking to Strangers 2019, describes the use of intensive stop and search, far more intensive than anything I've seen in this country, uh, where you could argue there's not enough stop and search in serious violent, violent hotspots because it has been so effective in the US and to say it doesn't work here is premature because I would argue it's never been tried. We have never concentrated stop and search in the same geographic proportion as the serious violent crime itself is concentrated. So I give you a perhaps unexpected message that our hypothesis is that more stop and search where violence is concentrated could be of great benefit, especially if what you want to do is to reduce racial disparity in stop and search, not per resident population, but per victimization by serious violence by race, which is far higher for blacks than it is for whites. And so the, the remedy to the failure to provide equal protection under the law for blacks and whites must be under the logic of mathematics where you can't maximize two functions simultaneously. If you want to reduce the racial disparity in victimization by violence, you have to create a violence-based index for measuring whether stop and search activity is sufficient. One thing that Chief Constable Vaughn did not mention is that Dorset's rate of 33 stop and search per 100 serious violent crimes is less than half the national average of 77 per 100 violent crimes. And that if by designing a, the first trial in Britain of intensive stop and search, in the highest violence areas of Dorset, that police force can demonstrate an effective way to create equal protection from 
harm by serious violence across races, that would be a major contribution to justice, to evidence-based policing, uh, even to democracy, because I think our democracies are being torn apart by racial disparities in both violent victimizations and in complaints about the ways in which police have dealt with that disparity. So I look forward to a session here a year from now uh, in which I hope everybody online uh, and uh, on uh, the Cambridge grounds today could uh, hear about the results of a trial in Dorset in which every effort was made to reduce the disparity in the number of stops of people by race uh, per hundred serious violent victimizations. Now, that disparity still exists. Uh, it's nowhere near the disparity for the resident population. It's about six to one, six or seven to one at the moment, across Dorset. But if the stop and search activity is concentrated, uh, and indeed potentially ramped up in the areas of serious violence, and it's tracked intensively by police uh, committed to uh, equality in the risk-adjusted disparity index, the number of stops divided by the number of violent crimes by race, um, then what we will have, I think, is one of the most advanced uses of evidence-based policing to tackle one of the most serious challenges to modern democracy in racially diverse societies, which is the allegation that the police activities uh, are uh, not providing equal protection under the law but with this twin dynamic of equal protection from violence as well as equal protection, uh, protection from disparate policing. So that is our challenge. I wouldn't want to prejudge the decisions about how to meet it in the design of the trial and what it might mean for the overall stop and search policy uh, across Dorset. Um, these are my hypotheses now and not the Dorset's police uh, uh, hypotheses. And uh, I think that whatever uh, happens, the fact that we were able to develop the risk-adjusted disparity index, which is now published in the Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing as of last week. Uh, it's open access, it's free for anybody who just looks up RAD, uh, risk-adjusted disparity index. You can read this article, there's some Dorset data, there's a forthcoming uh, further report breaking down all of the lower super output areas in Dorset. And uh, that's all I'm gonna say about it right now, except that there is uh, something to consider for everybody, and that is if you're going to do an experiment like this, it's best to have intensive training of the officers who are going to do it. And we are under discussion about having uh, some 75 officers from neighborhood police teams engaged in intensive training before the experiment is launched, before there's even consultation with the community about the design of the experiment, so that the entire approach can not only be evidence-led from the top, but evidence-led from the ground, of frontline policing. Everybody needs to be on the same page about these very complex, very serious issues. And I thank Dorset for giving us the opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, at, at this point, I'm going to thank our chair of the first session, uh, Dr. Sabir, uh, for her uh, hosting our discussion uh, and keeping us to time. Because right now, what I need to do is to become the chair of the next session and to invite Minister Kit Malthouse to come to the stage and to give us his perspectives on the challenging of serious crime by policing in England and Wales. Please uh, welcome to the stage, uh, Mr. Kit Malthouse. On March the 27th, uh, 2008, um, at about five o'clock in the afternoon, a 14-year-old boy called Amro al-Badawi uh, was stabbed in the neck uh, in Queen's Park in Northwest London. Um, a few hours later, a couple of miles north, a 17-year-old boy called Devo Roach um, was stabbed through the heart and killed in similar circumstances. At the time, um, I was a candidate for the London Assembly uh, elections, which were due to take place in the May of that year, and uh, Amro al Badawi was killed in my constituency. Uh, two weeks later, um, at their request, I visited his family in Queen's Park um, and saw for myself the devastation um, in the eyes of his father, um, having seen his eldest child murdered uh, literally outside their homes. 
and it crystallized for me um, an issue which had been a big part of the then mayoral election campaign uh, in the run of 2008, which was the growing sense, a sort of seething resentment uh, in London at the time about the significant rise in serious violence on the streets and in particular in teenage killings. Um, it played a big part um, in uh, Boris Johnson's victory and my victory um, in my seat uh, in the May of that year, uh, but it also placed a huge obligation on us uh, to focus on that particular issue and do something about it in the years that followed. Uh, sadly, uh, 2008 uh, saw too many young people uh, join those two boys who were killed, uh, Shackles Townsend, Jimmy Mizzen, Arsima Dawit, um, and many others. Uh, the total in 2008 was 29 uh, young people killed. Um, it was the worst year for many years. Um, but what followed uh, was a shared mission uh, between City Hall and the Metropolitan Police and indeed local authorities uh, in London to get on top of that problem uh, successfully to the extent that by the time we got to 2012 and the next mayoral election, uh, the number had fallen from 29 to 8. Uh, 8 too many, uh, but still a, a significant success uh, in that period. And what I thought I'd talk to you about this morning is what I learnt uh, during those four years. Um, um, and then, sadly, given that we're facing a not dissimilar situation now, particularly in the capital, uh, but across the whole country over the last uh, three or four years, we've seen serious violence and indeed murder spike upwards, uh, what we're doing about it uh, now. I guess I learnt in those um, uh, four years broadly uh, six things um, about the approach to serious violence, uh, which happily for me uh, now echo through some of the work that you were talking about, Lawrence, um, and indeed that others have done uh, as well. The first was the importance of place. Um, that violence almost always seemed to me strangely to be happening in the same places in London. Again and again and again, I found myself having conversations about the same boroughs, um, the same areas, uh, and in fact often uh, the same housing estates. Um, that there was a, a kind of sharp geographic focus to violence um, which indicated something uh, to us about where our attention needed to be. And in particular also, uh, we needed to treat the transport network as a place. Uh, that particularly in London, where there's obviously an extensive public transport network, uh, but more widely across the country, the roads and the rail, that transport, um, in the same way that it was a, uh, a channel for business and for all legitimate activity, was similarly an artery of, of crime. And that by concentrating on the transport network, you could have a significant impact and suppression effect on crime. The second thing I learned, and forgive me if this is all, uh, you know, an amateur speaking to professionals, but hopefully it will illustrate to you um, some of the thinking behind our strategy now. The second thing I learned was about the, the psychology of deterrence on crime. Um, that you can be smart about manipulating the psychology of a population uh, that you're trying to get to um, and raise the perception of the likelihood of getting caught, that being, as we know, the greatest deterrent to crime, that perception. And so, for example, some of the things uh, that we did, I think almost really by accident, had a dis disproportionate impact. In Croydon, uh, we worked out that every day, twice a day, between 30 and 40,000 kids would transit through Croydon Town Centre uh, on their way to and from school or whatever other activity they were doing. Um, it was a huge uh, conglomeration. And that by doing high profile operations in Croydon Town Centre at the right time, uh, knife arches, one stop and search, yes, but just generally having a high police presence, um, we essentially had 30 or 40,000 advertisers for what we were doing uh, because young people talked and the chatter amongst young people in South uh, London would increase every time we did an operation and help to raise that perception of likelihood of being caught. The third thing I learned that when, is that when we're doing uh, sometimes quite difficult and challenging things around serious violence and stop and search as you illustrated both of you neatly this morning, can be a very challenging thing to do, is political cover is absolutely key. Um, and that making sure that there is political legitimacy behind the work that the police are doing in this very difficult area 
is absolutely critical. And, and nowhere is that more critical, I think, than on stop and search. Because of the sensitivity of stop and search, because of the history of it, if you like, and the impact of it um, felt across uh, particular areas and particular communities because of its necessarily targeted nature, it's very important um, that the, the political leaders or the community leaders are, are alongside the operation. Um, and certainly between 2008 and, and 12, both the mayor and I spent many hours in meetings, large and small, um, uh, putting our weight behind the need for that kind of assertive action tonight. The line always was, well, give us something else to do uh, if it's not stop and search, but it has to be tonight because we know the, the knives are out there tonight, they're in people's pockets, they're likely to be used. Um, we need to remove them if we possibly can, um, and this is the, the best way that we can think of, of doing it. And we found that often in those meetings, while young people who'd been stopped and searched often many times were resentful, their parents weren't, um, and their parents were more accepting and could see the need because of the victimization uh, that you talked about, Lawrence, in particular communities, that there was a strong need uh, for that kind of intervention, and in the end, grudging acceptance from the young people as well. But it was all based on the notion that that sort of tactic, in essence, needed to be temporary. Um, <clears throat> because, and this was the, the fourth thing I learned, was that there was a strong sense, intuitively, from the community, but also now we know uh, empirically and, and from an evidence point of view, that their young people are on a journey uh, to, to violence, um, that there are points in that journey where we can intervene, there are things that we can do uh, to identify and prevent them from getting there in the first place um, uh, that will help with the long-term eradication of violence in a particular area or neighborhood or community. And that too often um, our attempts to do that have been um, uh, mis-aimed, we don't have a clear picture between public authorities, between the police and local authorities about who we're dealing with. We don't necessarily always have a sense of what's going wrong in their lives. The trigger is sometimes too high for intervention. We wait until the damage is, is almost irreparable uh, to them. And often our solutions, uh, the things we do to them, are um, well-meaning uh, but amateurish. Um, they're not focused, they're not scientific, they're not therapeutic in a, in a quasi-medical way, given that you're often dealing with deep psychological damage caused by broken attachments or whatever the, I think it's adverse childhood experiences is the, is the jargon phrase these days, but something has gone wrong in their lives. And too often we think that, um, you know, a bit of sport or a bit of music uh, will sort it out. Um, and it became clear to me during that time that not enough of those organizations were helping very well-meaning and very committed to the work they're doing, had any evidence whatsoever to prove that it was working, um, other than the odd anecdote here and there about somebody they'd happened to, to help, valuable though that may be. The fifth thing I learned was that we had a completely the wrong idea about gangs, um, or indeed perception about gangs. The first year or so um, uh, that I was at the Metropolitan Police Authority, the Met didn't really want to talk about gangs at all. Uh, wouldn't accept that gangs were a particular issue in the, in the capital. That all changed, of course, um, and it became clear that those semi-organized, possibly chaotic youth organizations, whatever they might be, we weren't clear about what their motivations were, we weren't clear about how they were driven or what their dynamics were, and so we weren't necessarily clear about how to eradicate them. Um, uh, and I have to say, one of the sad things for me about coming back into this world uh, a couple of years ago, uh, certainly in London, is that many of the names are the same. Um, you know, the names of the gangs that have given them, guns, money, whatever it is, man, dem, killers, the London Fields boys, all those gangs still exist, whatever, 10 years later, uh, which seems an extraordinary thing to me, that they, they, their persistence, their permanence, is sort of accepted and we manage their behavior, not necessarily focusing on how they work, what they're for, what motivates the members in an attempt to try and um, eradicate them. And then the sixth thing I learned was the, the connection sometimes, I think, between poverty and violence, deprivation and violence, um, is the wrong way around. Um, people blame the violence on the poverty rather than blaming the poverty on the violence. Um, you know, we learnt that as we got crime down, 
uh, in the capital over those, uh, well, eight years, I did it for four, um, that the perception of the city as a whole changed. You know, we had a great Olympics, foreign investment crashed over the city, and much of that was motivated by the fact that the city was safe, seemed to be the safest capital city in the world. And that is as true of a neighborhood and its prosperity and the um, opportunities that its residents have as it is of a city as a whole. Uh, the violence um, is as, as much a cause of the poverty as any other factors and is not a product of it. There are lots of areas of the country which have high levels of deprivation, which aren't violent. Um, and so the, the two don't necessarily, although they correlate, they, there isn't a causal factor there that way round. And so two years ago, now I found myself back in this uh, job in policing, uh, asked to try and, and do what I can uh, to get on top of the, the issue, um, given that over the last uh, three or four years we have seen a rise in serious violence across the country, uh, driven by changes, we think, in the drugs market, the rise of the county lines model that you referred to earlier, David, that, uh, that is um, causing so much violence, not just in the capital, but elsewhere. And as a result, we've obviously seen a rise in the number of murders uh, in the country, up from 500 and odd uh, to over 700 at the peak, although happily now uh, coming off. Uh, my predecessors obviously put in place a number of strategies to help with that and spent some money on what we call surge funding around policing. Uh, but what I've tried to do over the last uh, couple of years is bring a bit of focus uh, to the effort, um, bringing some of the lessons that I've learned and working, frankly, with some of the things I think that policing and the wider um, uh, crime-fighting family has learned over the intervening decade, uh, to look now, I think, broadly at three areas uh, where we're going to concentrate. The first, as I say, is on this, uh, this focus on place. Uh, having a sharp geographic focus and understanding of what's going on uh, in particular areas. And I helped in this by some accidental meetings. It's, it's slightly alarming how many of these things are accidental. So kicking indoors uh, in Essex uh, a few months ago, <clears throat> uh, came across Lewis Bassford, who I think you're going to hear from later today, who talked about Operation Ark in, in South End and his focus, having had, I think, come and studied here um, and taken and, and put it into practice some really startling results on sharp focus uh, of geographic uh, presence, if you like, hotspot policing, something uh, which, as Alex Murray then uh, led me on to Alex Murray's uh, lecture, I think, for the evidence-based policing conference last year or the year before, uh, given on a train, uh, eye-catchingly, uh, but nevertheless, where he talked about hotspot policing as well, um, and then that led me on to the, the work of, of Thomas Apt and his book, Bleeding Out, which similarly talks about the, the value of, of hotspot policing. Um, and in truth, what Alex Murray said in his lecture is, is correct, is that during certainly my time in policing, um, everybody's talked about hotspot policing. It's had different names. Uh, when I was at the Met Police Authority, it was Cops on Dots, they called it. Um, there was obviously the behind neighborhood policing was a sense of presence. We've had hotspot policing. We've now got Operation Arc. But in truth, I think we've never really done it um, properly, and it's never been a permanent part uh, of policing, a sustained part of policing, uh, where it shows real results. And so what we've done this year is take what was surge funding, call it grip funding, uh, target it uh, into the 18 forces with the highest levels of violence on a request uh, that they focus very sharply on micro-violence hotspots along the model uh, that was adopted in, in South End um, uh, to show that when we are consistent and focused and we use the data properly, uh, we can have an impact. Um, that uh, approach will be rolling out over the summer. Happily, it coincides with the release from uh, COVID restrictions, which has had a, an impact on crime up and down. You know, we saw a surge last August. I'm hopeful that that new tactic will help us get on top of a surge, a possible surge, uh, this summer. The second thing we're obviously concentrating on drugs. I think the big difference over the last 10 years uh, for me that I've seen has been the growth of drugs as a driver of violence. We had it then, of course, um, but it wasn't sitting behind quite so much of the violence, and particularly not amongst young people, this awful, pernicious, horrendous model of county lines where young people are often victimized and driven 
into activity, um, uh, uh, which is incredibly violent. Uh, in my own constituency in Andover, a town, a very low crime town, we had a horrible murder, neither victim nor perpetrator from Andover, um, uh, come down to deal drugs and fight about uh, the territory. Concentrating on county lines, driving those uh, gangs out of the, of the rural areas and the smaller towns, as well as suppressing violence generally at home, we think will have a big issue, a big impact. And one of the key aspects of that, I think, and this links to what I said about us not understanding gangs and how they work, was what I asked at the start was for people to think differently about what a county line drugs gang was. Um, and not necessarily to see it as a group of criminals, but to see it as a business. That this was an operation that was fundamentally being uh, prosecuted to get money. Um, and that if you saw it as a business, then interfering with that business led you uh, towards a, a kind of different approach. Uh, the standard approach, of course, uh, identify the whole gang from soup to nuts, the lot of them, then have a massive operation on one day where they're all taken out, they're all put in front of the court, uh, all go to prison for a long time. It takes a long time, it's, it's very expensive. Uh, but when you think about it as a business, there are lots of things that business do that make them vulnerable, that we can uh, intercept and use, frankly, uh, to dismantle it. So their use of the transport network, as I said earlier, if we can grip the transport network, um, then we start to restrict their ability to distribute their product and indeed bring the money back. And the British Transport Police are doing a fantastic work now with a county lines task force, which we've paid for. Um, they're discovering all sorts of things about the transport network that they didn't know before. Got their first sniffer dogs for over a decade, uh, which is doing great work. Uh, similarly, the, two, the three big exporting forces, Liverpool, West Midlands, London, given money specifically to work up operations so that with importing forces, as soon as a gang appears um, in lovely Dorset, um, that they, you know, they can work with the origins of that gang uh, to take out particularly uh, the high quality controller of the line, make sure they get the person that's controlling the whole operation, uh, because we want those individuals with unique skills rather than necessarily the people who are replaced at the front end quickly, that we can degrade that business as well. And that work is having an enormous impact. Um, uh, Norfolk, uh, for example, who were first on the scene uh, with, the, with the operation um, uh, 16 months ago, had seen in the previous three years an enormous spike in horrendous violence in a county which was not used to it. They tried the standard criminal justice approach at their end of arresting the drugs mules um, uh, who were perpetrating a lot of the violence, but only to see them replaced within half an hour. Um, and it was having no impact on the violence whatsoever, if anything, it was driving it up. The moment they got involved in what's called Operation Orochi um, in London, which is where most of the gangs were coming from, they saw an immediate impact. And we're now at a situation where having had over 100 lines into the county 16 months ago, they're now down to under 10, um, and hopefully soon to eradicate them as well. And we've seen similar results across the country. Uh, Kent have halved their number. Um, we saw North Wales police, after 20 years uh, of drug dealing by Liverpool gangs in Bangor in North Wales, have now declared it county lines free. Um, by a simple approach, a rethinking of the approach, and working together on that particular issue, we can drive it down and the violence with it. We've invested £65 million now in that program. Um, it's having a huge impact, and I hope to see more. And then the third area that we're going to concentrate on is obviously on uh, people. Um, we know, they talked about it as well in the past, <clears throat> there are hot people, but we are able now, um, uh, with the power of the data that we have, to identify pretty much in every county a kind of top list of uh, both those who are likely to be perpetrators of, of violence or indeed uh, victims, and often they are one and the same. The key thing is making sure we have a shared picture. Um, and through the violence reduction units, which are now in their third year, actually, um, uh, across the country, we are now demanding a much sharper focus on that shared picture of who we're dealing with um, and what other organizations can do to help us. That will be assisted by the new serious violence duty, which is coming in legislation later this autumn. It's in the bill that's going through at the moment, and that will demand that local authorities, health, and others come alongside uh, the police to assist in the, the, the fight. So the VRUs, 18 of them across the country, but I'm hopeful the model will be adopted elsewhere, uh, will provide that data, that list, 
that sharp focus on, on individuals, which means that we can concentrate on them. Um, in high harm, uh, with high harm individuals, we're piloting now a thing called the Knife Crime Prevention Order in, in London. Um, if that goes well over the next year, uh, we can roll that out to the rest of the country. And that is an order that the police can apply for an individual who they believe either has been convicted of a knife crime or is a, um, uh, they, they suspect of carrying a knife. And it's a negative and positive. They can't go to the town center. They must go to this training center. Uh, it can put those kind of obligations on people. Um, and we're willing to try other, other innovations. But the identification of those individuals and making sure that all the partners that we need to intervene um, uh, with them on this journey towards crime, um, I think are absolutely critical. I would recommend to you, as you do your work, um, uh, that you pick up from time to time some of the very, very sad um, uh, uh, serious case reviews that happen after a young person is killed. Um, uh, because they're A, incredibly sad and moving, but B, incredibly informative. And in particular, I would point you uh, towards one uh, that was written about the death of, of Jaden Moody, who was a young boy, a 14-year-old boy, stabbed by a, a group of older boys uh, in London, in Leighton, in February 2019. Um, and when you read the story of his life, um, you absolutely see the journey to where he was, to the extent that uh, three months before he was killed, uh, he was found um, in a drugs den in Bournemouth, um, having been missing from home uh, for three days, and nobody had mentioned it. Um, a 14-year-old boy, two and a half hours from home for three days, nobody mentioned it, nobody would get it. When he was brought back, um, he was just brought back and let go, and that was it. Three months later, he was dead. Um, these are the kind of sad stories from which we must learn collectively and where I hope the serious violence duty will sharpen the obligation of the social care authorities and health uh, to help us. On top of that, obviously, we're doing quite a lot structurally uh, to help with serious violence. Hopefully, 20,000 new police officers will assist. Um, and please remember that to, to get to 20,000 extra police officers, we've got to recruit about 45,000 in total. Um, that means we're going to have an awful lot of police officers who will be in uniform, able to perform that sentinel duty, if you like, outside, um, uh, in uniform, in the streets, helping to suppress violence, uh, particularly in hotspots. And through the National Policing Board, we've set some national priorities, very much focused in this area, putting murder top of the tree, the suppression of murder, which we hope will mean that police forces need to reach back into the crime types that culminate in a murder, domestic violence, obviously drugs, gangs, guns, and young people um, uh, that culminate in, in a murder to suppress that, as well as setting serious violence uh, as a, a key indicator for the future. All of that now sits under a crime and justice task force, which is chaired by the Prime Minister. Should be no surprise that as a crime-fighting mayor, he now wants to be a crime-fighting PM. Um, and I was there yesterday with him being challenged on exactly these issues. All of this, I hope, will come together um, along with you and the very valuable work that you're doing today um, into a, a scientific, evidence-based approach uh, to deal with violence. Ten years ago, I think it's fair to say that when we took on the violence in the capital, much of what we did was based on intuition. Um, what's happened in the, in the intervening uh, decade is that we've acquired a huge amount more into knowledge in terms of data, international comparisons. We've obviously got this program here in Cambridge, which is doing great work in, in pointing uh, the way forwards. And we have a, a police force, uh, which is much more technology enabled than it used to be. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, there was a lot of green screen around. Uh, now, um, you'll find police officers much more familiar with and motivated by and assisted by technology in a way we weren't before. And that will allow us, I think, um, over the next couple of years to get on top of some of these issues and drive it down. Final word from me, just before I'm happy to take some questions, is, is just a recommendation to all of you, uh, which is that it, it's very important, I think, in all our work on violence that we see the human beings at the other side. Uh, we often talk about statistics, and in a world of data, it's easy to do that. Um, and one of the, the saddest things for me when I first got to City Hall uh, was meeting senior officers at the Metropolitan Police and being told that in a city of six and a half million people, um, having you know, 10 or 12 uh, teenagers stabbed and killed was statistically insignificant. 
Right? Those are somebody's kids. Whatever you might think about them, whatever they might have done in their lives, somebody's children, brother, sister. Right? We have to see the human being in all of these things. And if we do that, along with the skills and the tools that we now have in modern policing, then I think we can have a huge impact. Thank you very much indeed for having me today. Oh, it's, it's fantastic, and I was very keen to come along and talk to you because this is one of the critical missions for us as a government, to get on top of the violence, which sadly has spiked, um, but which we know we can return to a downward trend, and it'll be great to work with all of you to get us there. Lisa Minister, thank you. Two questions, if I may. Uh, first one, just in relation to the violent crime duty. Um, do you think contained within that there may be some opportunity to share data better, particularly with the NHS, which seems to be a perennial issue within VOUs. And then secondly, a uh, slightly provocative question, and I might anticipate your answer, but just in relation to GRIP, the ability to be stable in the funding of that gives us greater opportunities to embed that and, and maintain that, and the year to year funding presents a, a, an operational challenge to that. So just your views or comment on that, if I may, please, Minister. Yeah, okay. Uh, so on your first, on your, your second point first, on the, the grip and the funding, I mean, look, what I'm, I'm trying to do with all the, uh, the programs that we've started, the County Lines program, the grip funding, the various other bits and pieces, is um, effectively show success uh, through what we're doing to the extent that uh, chiefs and um, police and crime commissioners see that success and decide to start investing in it themselves, right? Because it, it, while, you know, we're obviously in a challenging uh, economic environment, um, post-COVID, all the rest of it, we have seen some great settlements for policing over the last two years. We're committed to the 20,000 police officers, you know, and we've got another, whatever, eight to 9,000 to go um, in the third year. Um, we're well ahead of schedule. We might get there early. Quite a lot of, of chiefs are, are recruiting ahead of schedule, which is fantastic. Uh, but as we move towards full capacity on cops, what I'm hoping is that success we see, for example, on hotspot policing becomes exactly that, becomes kind of mainstreamed part of the day-to-day -day business that because we've got the greater police capacity, you know, we've got our response is satisfied. Obviously, triple nine has to be dealt with. We've got enough response. We've now got the capacity to do some other work. And we're seeing that um, in parts of the, of the country already. So, for example, I was in the... Uh, in um, Bromley uh, with the Met, seeing their predatory offenders unit. Um, and the predatory offenders unit is exactly a product of the extra capacity that they've got that they can do other things. The, the, that is a unit which looks at individuals who have been um, uh, violent towards their partners in domestic abuse and otherwise, but the partner's too frightened to, to take a prosecution or to give evidence, so they have a look at the individual to see if they can get them some other way. Um, it's a really good unit taking out some very nasty, violent individuals, but that's come about purely because of the, of the extra capacity. So what I hope is exactly that, that this stuff will mainstream. County lines, the hotspot grip funding, all of that will become business as usual. Frankly, I think as, as, as Alex Murray said in, his, uh, in this lecture, I would, if you haven't seen it, urge you to look it up. It, you'll know it's the one, it's on YouTube because he gives it on a train. Um, and it, it, it's exactly that. He says, look, we've tried hotspots, we do it for a bit, we've never done it on a sustained basis, it needs to be part of day-to-day -day business. So yes, um, I will keep up the capacity as, as long as I possibly can, um, uh, and what I hope is that as the numbers fall, the key thing from my point of view is that when it works, and it will work, and the numbers fall, there will be a, a temptation to do something else. And it feels to me as if that's the mistake that was make, made between the end, you know, the 2008-12 period and now, in that we all went off to do other things, and suddenly here we are back with knife crime and, and county lines on the rise. So embedding it as part of, of, of the, the warp and weft of policing is the mission, and we'll fight about the money when we get there. Um, on your first um, issue, I find myself wandering around the the crime-fighting landscape constantly astonished at the inability to share data and thinking to myself, what would the British public think uh, about this? I mean, we've, we've had situations where the police and the Crown Prosecution Service can't share data around the prosecution of a criminal. I think people would think that was, was bonkers. 
And so part of my job is to find those lacunae, those breaks, those dams in the data and try and put them all uh, together or try and overcome them. Uh, we're, you know, in conversation uh, with the ICO about some of these things and we want to have a kind of proactive approach with them where we go and say, look, here is a, some data that we can put together um, uh, which will give us a great result. Uh, can we please? Um, and we'll test that envelope as much as we possibly can. Having said that, um, we still have some basic areas where data is not fully shared, and it can be. So some areas uh, are doing extremely well, for example, on, on violence, and in particularly focused on young people. You know, I was at uh, Thames Valley Police uh, a month or so ago. They've got a fantastic, you know, best-in-class data sharing, real-time data sharing between local authorities and police around young people, which gives them their list of the top 874 individuals that they're concerned about in their county. Um, there are some where I go and say, have you got a shared list? Oh, uh, we're sort of getting there, right? So there's a lot for us to do as well before we get onto that more complicated stuff. But the serious violence duty will be, I think, a real game changer on this because it will put the boot up local authorities and critically health um, uh, to put all that data together so they've got a shared picture because they want to have a duty as well. And I, it was most illustrated for me uh, that problem where when I was at uh, the police authority, and I'm, I hate talking about it, it feels like one of those like armchair generals who've retired, but when I was there, we started to do these things called joint engagement meetings with every borough in London where we would get the police, the local authority, the health service, the ambulance service to come together. Uh, to share their data, we do a big PowerPoint together. And what was amazing was that the ambulance hotspots for violence were completely different from the police hotspots for violence. That the, the two, there was some overlap, but broadly they were different. And their sense of problem premises was different from police sense of problem premises. So if we're going to have that sharp geographic focus, it's critical we have a shared picture, and we'll try and do that under the SV duty. Good morning, Minister. Lisa Wilson from Lancashire Police. Um, I think it's great that the government have put some money um, forward for looking at hotspots under the GRIP funding. I just wondered if there's any direction to police forces on how those hotspots are determined, whether it's crime count or crime harm. Well, it's a, it's a good question. And to be honest with you, I, I think it's for you. I mean, one of the things we, we've asked for as part of the GRIP funding um, it, essentially is that you, you know, the, the key characteristics of ARC, which you're going to hear about uh, later, that they are adopted. Um, that there is a, you know, you've got your hotspots, your micro hotspots mapped, that you, you've got the idea that, um, you know, cops will visit them on a random basis, that there is a strong sense of presence there uh, during the day, and that we see the results as they come through. But variations across the, the whole of policing, I think is absolutely fine. One of the things we want to do in this first stage is kind of learn from different areas, and it will depend. So, you know, your hotspot policing in, in parts of Lancashire will be different from London um, because the, the, the geography is different, the built environment is different, the demographics are different. So I'm, I'm sort of relaxed about how you define it as long as the violence numbers overall drop. I mean, my key indicator is, is um, uh, injuries to admissions to hospital with a knife injury. Um, that's the, the measure on which we're all being held, and if that you know, it's third party, so it's not for us to decide. Uh, if that number falls, which happily, thankfully, touch wood it now is, um, then I'm content. But the critical thing that I want to see, and I think the team wants to see, is, is a sharp understanding of where they are. And one of the things that was very striking about the, the South End evidence that I saw was that sometimes that was 200 yards of a particular street. It was that micro. Um, and that by having a 15-minute-a-day presence on a random basis in that micro hotspot, they saw 70% falls in, in violence. Now, other people are getting there, uh, sort of got there accidentally. So I saw the, uh, the Boku commander in Hounslow in London at about the same time. Um, Hounslow, amazingly, was the second most violent um, uh, town center in the capital. Um, and he got into the job and decided that he wasn't having this anymore. And so he started... Uh, hammering the street drug dealers um, in the town centre, in a sharp bit of the town centre. Similarly, 70% falls in, in violence um, in that particular part of London. Now, that is a sort of getting there by another means, right? He'd got his hotspot, he knew what it was, but it was drug-defined. He was hammering those people, and as a result, he saw violence drop. 
So it, it depends. But the key characteristics, from my point of view, need to be there. And the critical thing is sustain. Sustain, sustain. It's not a surge. It's not a, a blitz. We're not going for two or three months. We are sustaining it there day after day after day after day. And the, the, the critical thing, I think, from a sort of workforce management point of view is obviously, you know, if you're a police officer, it's quite dull, actually. Um, but the great thing about the, the, the ARC model is that it's, it's not a huge infringement on your day. It's a kind of drop in uh, for a short period, park the car up somewhere quite high profile, walk around and say hello to people, make yourself your presence felt, and then kind of get on with the rest of your day. Um, and for me, that was quite you know, a good thing for a police force that wants to be hunters rather than sentinels. That's the exciting bit. The sentinel model is, is not that exciting, but in the right place at the right time, it can be incredibly effective. How do we square the circle of uh many of our communities not believing that violent crime is key at a policing priority. They are more concerned, and they tend to be the white middle class, um, more concerned about antisocial behavior, travelers. Uh, James talked about jumping off the top of, uh, you know, tombstoning, uh, e-scooters. How do we ensure that we get the message across that there needs to be some form of priority. We need to get in early and we need to prioritize with a significant amount of resources uh, those crimes that lead to serious violence and hopefully prevent murder in, in the long run. So it's, it's a really great question. And I, uh, like you, have sat in, in you know, ward panel meetings where um, you know, the biggest priorities that have been raised have been cycling on the pavement and, and dog mess. Um, and I, you know, I've said to me, you, you do know there was a murder like five streets away three weeks ago, kind of thing, and that's, you know, and, and there is a, a discontinuity there, right? So people don't think it's about them until it actually happens outside their uh, front door and it's easy to be separated from it. I mean, <clears throat> in the end, uh, to a certain extent, you have to, you have, to have a mission that does both. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm hesitant to have a, a list of priorities, each of which has a one in front of it. Um, and it is quite tough to tell people that this crime is more important than that crime. Uh, fundamentally, though, that's the job of your, your police and crime commissioner. And when I said that you need to use them, you know, the local leaders to buy the legitimacy about what you're doing, that's pretty critical. It is, however, possible, I think, to do um, both and to address the things that the British people think are most important. And what I've talked about in the past is alongside violence, uh, which is one of them, I, I basically talked about the big five um, that we need to address. And as you know, the National Policing Board has got those five priorities, murder, serious of violence and drugs, and then neighborhood around burglary, robbery, car crime. Um, and if it's sold as a package, um, then the people are, you know, in my, in my experience thus far, people are very accepting about that. But at the same time, you know, uh, they have expectations about antisocial behavior in their area. They want to make sure that they can walk in the park without being uh, molested by a group of teenagers who are jostling and, and behaving badly. And I hope that as we give you the extra capacity over the next two years or so, uh, you'll be able to do both. Um, but if, you, if it comes down to the choice, I think you just have to grit your teeth and go for violence. I just wanted to ask your viewers on um, county lines and what we've heard a lot about this morning around traveling criminals and children that are being exploited yeah. to then go to other areas. And it strikes me we talk a lot about dealing with the symptom rather than the cause. And actually these children are often victims that are exploited in areas that are hot spots in themselves because of deprivation and lots of other reasons. Within that, clearly the police have got a role to play, but there's a wider partnership mm -hmm. role to try to actually make those more hostile areas for recruiting the next group of counterline victims. So I wondered what your views were on the role of the police within that to get to the real root cause of it and actually how we all work together as part of a partnership to address it. Yeah, so look, I think there are two things. I mean, the first thing is, is from my point of view, police have to be focused on the exploiters. Um, I keep saying to everybody, it's a bit like that, uh, that Christmas cracker joke. How do you kill a circus? Go for the juggler, right? The key is that you, you know, we know that there are 
people in each of those organizations who have unique skills. Right, they're the people holding the, the, the phone, they are the people with the Rolodex, they are the, the people who know where to get the wholesale drugs, they're unique skills. And they are the people who are recruiting and exploiting the young people. So the first thing we can do, I think, is a, from our point of view, is target them. And the great thing about Orochi and Toxic in Liverpool and in West Midlands is that that is exactly what they're doing. They're targeting those guys. Um, and then alongside that, obviously, there's the safeguarding. And I think we've safeguarded over 1,500 young people now as part of the, over the last 16 months, which is great news. But using the serious violence duty and the shared local picture to identify those young people who are most likely to get involved in this sort of activity and then get local authorities and others to intervene with them earlier. The saddest thing, as I said, about the Jaden Moody issue, there he was, right, in county lines, in Bournemouth, uh, been there for three days in a drugs den. You found him and safeguarded him and sent him back. But then what? Three months later, dead. Still drug dealing, albeit in London, and dead. And so bringing local authorities and others alongside to stand with you and say, right, okay, we'll receive this individual um, and do what we can to try and make sure that there's no reoccurrence that, I hope, will be reinforced um, in the months and years to come as part of that SV uh, duty. Um, I mean, the other thing we could do, obviously, which more and more is to provide a greater deterrence. I mean, I know there are more and more prosecutions of the jugglers now under child grooming legislation and modern slavery. I mean, child grooming, I know Liverpool are very keen on this. Child grooming is very powerful because if they're convicted, they have, they're imprisoned on the sex offender's wing. Uh, which even for a drug dealer is a big deterrent. There's not something that they want on their scorecard. Um, and modern slavery, obviously, you know, much stiffer, much stiffer sentences than, than just drug dealing. And so there's lots we can do from a deterrent point of view as well. But I think take out the unique skills and the exploiters and then really pin on a shared picture with our partners the obligation to intervene with exactly the young people you're talking about. I, we welcome the, um, the surge funding for the violence reduction. Um, and it f sort of follows on from the last officer's question, but uh, are there any plans, um, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, for um, appropriate funding for the prison service and for gang diversion um, organizations, which I think play a vital part in, you know, rather than punishing, rehabilitating young people and also diverting them from the gangs that do operate in young offenders institutions as well as outside. I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not my area of responsibility, so I have to be careful. Although the area at the MOJ I'm responsible for is the, is the revamp of integrated offender management, um, although it's obviously not at a youth justice end. And some of the techniques that we're using as part of IOM, um, I am quite keen to expand um, into other parts of the system. So for example, um, as you might know, one of the projects we've got on at the moment is the, is the GPS tagging of acquisitive criminals. Um, that's a, up and running in six forces now, um, with some good results emerging already. We go to another 13, I think, uh, later on this year. <clears throat> and it's having a huge psychological impact on the offenders themselves. Um, one of the things we know about uh, particularly young people who are involved in gangs and drugs is that many of them are sort of reluctant uh, they don't really want to be. They're, they're terrorized into it by a smaller group of highly violent individuals who create a culture of violence and recruit them in. Um, we do know uh, that when young people are from time to time who are involved in that tagged, it provides a wonderful excuse uh, not to go back to that life. It's something they can point to um, and say, look, I'm useless to you now uh, because they know where I am at all times. Um, and we're going to be looking at, at some of the, that, that stuff in the future, I hope. Uh, but for the moment, uh, the big area of focus, I think, on, on um, uh, prisons at the moment has to be, has to be drugs. Um, drugs is still far too prevalent in our prison system, and I know my colleague Alex Chalk is doing a huge amount to drive that down. The other thing that I'm very keen on is, is data. So as you know, as you might know, as people come through the prison service, uh, they accumulate a score um, about their proclivity to violence. Um, it's not always the case that that score is shared on release so that police forces have an idea who's coming into their area. I think there's much more we can do about that as well. Great. Well, well, now we're going to hear uh, from two of the experiments that have been conducted with uh, the surge funding and now moving into GRIP. 
And we hope that you can stay for some of it, but we know you have a demanding I do. I will stay, yes. Well, that's terrific. So I'm going to invite Chief Constable Chris Sims, uh, the former Chief Constable of West Midlands, uh, who was the supervisor of um, uh, uh, Lewis Basford, who conducted one of these experiments. And uh, well, I don't want to break the flow because this next session um, absolutely builds on the discussion that we've just had. But it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce two experiments around hotspots. And I suppose over the last 25 years, one of the signature contributions that Cambridge has made has been about developing uh, an understanding of the benefits of hotspot policing. And I completely uh, agree with the minister's view that... Um, Gaining an understanding is not quite the same as rigorous implementation. So you have two experiments um, that you're going to hear about. Um, Matt Bland and Michelle Leggett are going to talk about some interesting work in Bedfordshire. Um, but first, um, heavily trailed already, Lewis Basford is going to talk about the uh, work that he did in Essex. And uh, as Larry said, uh, I had the privilege of supervising that work. I learned a tremendous amount uh, from Lewis as we went along. Uh, you will hear, I think, about a really cleverly designed um, research piece that was um, rigorously implemented by Lewis. Um, his personal contribution was amazing. And as you've already heard, it is proving to be incredibly influential. So, uh, Lewis, without further ado, the floor is yours. So, yeah, my name is Lewis Bastard. I'm the uh, Detective Chief Inspector from, uh, from Essex. And um, I'm actually responsible for, um, for last year and for this year, spent for last year's surge funding and obviously this year um, the GRIP funding. And as part of that, obviously part of the leadership and the programme, um, I was in my second year last year and we obviously undertake, undertook the thesis and the, and the operation we did uh, in Essex. We all like an operation name, so in Essex it was called Operation Arc. And, and it was looking at the effects of um, those 15-minute foot patrols in our most chronic um, high-harm areas. So key research, que research question that I had was, does additional foot patrols in outdoor crime harm spots reduce outdoor crime harm, and how long does it affect um, for that one day of that patrol? And we talked, uh, someone made a question around, you know, between harm and count. We went for harm, and, and the reason is because, probably because of what the minister said, you know, around... You know, we're looking at those highest harm offences, those knife-enabled injuries that clearly are going to be more defined um, with more higher harm. However, you know, with the nuance, actually, you can see this, the actual crime count behind it, and you can have an informed decision around uh, what you're looking at. So the way we, obviously, the way we identified, we looked at a mixed method, mixed method approach of uh, identifying our harm spots. They were obviously weighted by the Cambridge Crime Harm Index. Um, and, we, and we were looking at, and we only introduced the crimes that we knew that we could have an influence at, at a street base level. So, um, and what we call the community violence. So it was all very much street based, it excluded uh, domestic um, abuse. And it was anything that I felt and we felt as an organisation that actually we could alter by having a presence on that street um, and having, the, having that visibility of, of, a, of a cop, um, as we talk, copped in the dot or, you know, within that harm spot. And we talked about the micro locations, they were 150 metres by 150 metres in terms of how we defined them. But obviously, as part of the analysis, we looked wider at those buffer areas to see um, how crime either moved or it did it move. And I'll talk to you about that in the, in the results as we go forward. Just to give you an illustration, it was 150 metres. We looked at buffer areas. We did increase the buffer areas as we, as we looked at the data and the, and the results we had. And hopefully, they'll, they'll be quite interesting as I, as I move forward. So we use South End on C because South End was actually our um, statistical outlier for violence of all the areas in Essex. Um, we when we looked at our harm spots, we were able to generate 20 harm spots, and as you see here, they they were actually 30% of all of our street-based violence, but 48% of all harm at a street-based level occurring in 2.6% of our geographical space just in South End on C. The actual, uh, the way we did it in terms of our allocation, we went for um, every day doing eight harm spots um, visits a day. Um, I think we took, someone um, touched upon the fact, you know, how do we operationalise this? Well, these eight harm spots were conducted using um, surge money uh, from last year. So over 90 days, we spent um, just, or just about £22,000 delivering eight harm spot visits a day at varying times when we know that they were most harmful between one o'clock in the afternoon and, and sort of midnight. Um, 
And what we did was we randomised those um, 20 harm spots. So we did eight visits a day, and obviously 12 of them were control. They were randomised, and as you can see on the, on the screen on the presentation, that presented obviously a number of days where they were um, control, a number of days where they had treatment. Some got one day's treatment followed by four days control, and you can see the amount of, um, that we obviously we, were, we had. So we have that real true randomization and, um, and obviously that you know, crossover design. Um, so we could have the, obviously the interrogation of the data and, and, hand, and the implementation of what we did. I'm gonna talk about inflation very quickly because you know, one of the bits, obviously year one um, of this program, learning actually from the mistakes of the people that tried to do this before. Um, and so we spent, I spent a lot of time prior to, de to deployment time, spending time with the officers that were doing it. I was really looking that actually what I did here was we had a, a collection of officers that were doing the overtime daily for us and they were they numbered about 60 in, to 60 in total so every single officer received a two-hour evidence-based input talking about hotspots what went well what hasn't gone well other people's work and why we were then also um, why I was asking what I was going to ask for in terms of the um, actual intervention intervention stage um, as part of those briefings, they also had um, the deployment packs, which were digital within our uh, mobile first project, um, so they could access them at any time. Um, for the, um, we were using our uh, operational support group for this, so obviously public order trained uh, type officers to make it more simple for them. We gave them what three words, so they knew they were in the harm spot. And to make it even better, we used a system called Airbox, which pinged when they went in. So you know, we tried to give them all those fail safes around knowing they were there and, and knowing what we wanted them to achieve, as well as what it visually looked like as they were, as they were going to the harm spot. Um, feedback, um, feedback every day in, in relation to those harm spots, that's both from me and from, and from them. They talked about their interactions with the public, but also I fed back when I looked at the trackers and bits and have actually had you spend the right amount of right time in those harm spots. And actually moving forward for this year, we're actually using Office 365 QR codes where they're scanning QR codes in the car and doing a quick return sheet, which then is giving us the data that we can put back as to know when people were there, what they were doing, you know, are they, have they reported something to the council around, you know, broken windows, broken lighting, you know, very much a data rich um, feedback scheme now we now have in, how have in place. In terms of the infant intervention, actually, it was, it was quite, obviously I'm using public order cops um, that predominantly we, we're putting out each day to do enforcement and actually what I was asking them to do was not do that and the, for me it was about visibility it was getting them into the community to build that trust and what we were asking them to do was literally as simple as, as part of the deployment pack um, pictures you see there park the car in the most visible space you can on the day foot patrol for 15 minutes no more no less and just in, interact with the public on a on a one-to-one -one basis it's not disorder policing tactics it was actually trying to build that trust and um, cohesion actually just have that presence as um, to deter crime um, moving forward if you know if I was going to do this again what I would obviously what we are looking to do is actually trying to um, see actually what effect we have on that community confidence through this type of policing and um, from a tracking point of view you see here um, the officers actually did the deployments each day um, were subject to the tracking um, and, that, and that tracking actually element was fed back to them each day just to show them you know, how, how make, to, so they do themselves that they've done the right amount of times. Um, but also we used um, telematics to look at the overdosage and the additional treatment um, that obviously we, we had from the officers doing the deployment. I'm going to go into the findings now because I think that's the, the key bit really. And that is um, the one takeaway and I think is from this is we talked about making this business as usual. But through making it business as usual, you've got to have compliance. And I think the results that I'm about to show you were because, and my, you know, my hypothesis is that actually it's because we had 98% compliance. So of those 90 days, there were 720 location visits, obviously eight a day over 90 days. And we only missed 12 um, physical locations. Um, and that was, as you can see here, seven was because we actually arrested people within a harm spot. Um, and there was just no resilience to take that prisoner away from by other means. Two were for, uh, sorry, three were for forced critical instance and two were for the uh, notorious car breakdown. Um, as you see here, we, we mapped obviously additional doses from those officers not on this uh, trial um, to see what happened on treatment and control days. Um, we used telematics data, so every car in Essex has that telematics. So we lo I looked at those cars that stopped or were idle in those harm spots for, um, for, for that period of time. And then we looked at that average over the, over the period of the study. And actually, when you look at it, from a treatment day, actually, they only got an additional one minute 33, and on a control day, two minutes. So actually, we're not putting that, we weren't going to those areas that we, um, that we know were the most harmful. And anecdotally, as part of this, actually, 
is I've um, got the local policing team who knew nothing about this actually going on and got them with a one P piece to try and find me the 20 harm spots. I was, I was really generous and they got it right about 16% of the time because they knew a couple of them in the town centre were the hot spots and that's the ones that they predominantly got. And, it's, and it just showed actually that knowledge that they didn't know where they, where they needed to go. Straight into the results then. So crime harm for community violence was, saw a reduction of 88.5%. It was lower on experimental days um, with those extra patrols of just 15 minutes. That worked out a crime, uh, mean crime harm of 9.3 versus 1.7 when you looked at control and treatment. But actually, those additional benefits, we're talking about violence here today, but actually all street visible crime went down, was down by 35.6% of harm, um, again, on those visits. That's the difference between 12.33 um, control versus 7.94 for treatment. And when you look at crime count, crime count was for all street visible crime was down by 31% um, when you looked at uh, on, the, on those treatment days. Again, just showing you the mean then of those days um, for the offences that occurred. So what, what is the takeaway from this? In essence, you've got 60 minutes of foot patrol a day. If you add that up, it prevents 21 days of imprisonment, equivalent to 20 common assaults and one ABH. And that's a total system, for a total system cost of £100 per day on patrol. When I looked at the um, social the sort of socioeconomic cost as well, when you look at the cost of policing um, for my force, I, you know, I looked, and we talked about making this business as usual, um, the conversations I'm having in force now or trying to influence in my force now with my chief officer group is actually this was eight harm spots a day at £22,000 for 90 days. If I'd done this in I think another five areas and we had the same results, you're talking um, near on a million pounds worth of um, savings just for Essex and that's just doing eight harm spots a day in about five different areas of Essex. Um, Yes, we have to get the results and we have to get the compliance, but actually I think from my point of view, you know, £22,000 investment over 90 days um, for the reduction and the, the socioeconomic cost that we had here um, was, was significant. And then I'm going to take, um, I'm not very, very, I don't very often um, sell my own praise, but actually, you know, one of the big thing highlights for me from this course, and I'm going to say it, is actually the influence that the, the support I've had through the, um, the leadership programme with the ability then to, I say influence, but partake and support, um, obviously the police grip funding. And obviously you can see, obviously we're in the, within the Home Office document released and trying to support all the forces this year with the implementation. Um, and hopefully, you know, certainly within my force, it becomes business as usual um, as we look to look at our investment of our 20,000 cop uplift for Essex. Um, and actually when you look at the numbers of the officers you need for those amount of areas, it's actually quite minimal. You know, I'm, I'm projecting you know, we could do this between 12 and 16 cops in Essex um, just by doing these intense visits, and that's without looking then at problem orientated approaches that you know, we look within them. I'm Dr Matt Bland. Um, I'm a lecturer here at the, the University of Cambridge, and um, I've had the, the opportunity for the last, uh, last year and a half, I guess it might even be longer than that now, to be working with some great colleagues at, at Bedfordshire Police, including Michelle Legator, who's going to double hand this uh, presentation with me. Um, she has by far the more interesting side of things. I have the very easy job of following Lewis, who goes into so much detail that I can effectively say what he said. Um, and I have to come up with more and more catchy uh, ways of capturing your imagination, such as um, the, the, the sort of embellished claim of how Bedfordshire reduced violence by a quarter with just 15 minutes a day patrolling. I'm going to reiterate many of the things in this, uh, my slides, um, that Lewis has already said, but none of that can do any harm because this is a really key message that we need to get across. There is nothing in the evidence-based policing world that has a more compelling evidence base to it than hotspot policing. Uh, and in terms of that point around cost benefit, you know, we're not talking about rocket science of policing tactics here, we're talking about 15 minutes of patrolling a day. I liken this to the equivalent of taking vitamins to stave off illness. Really simple, doesn't take very long, but you need to consistently do it and you will have good results. Um, and I just want to tell you about how we did this as part of Operation Rowan uh, in Bedfordshire, which is an interesting parallel to Operation Arc because it acknowledges that every police force in England and Wales, although they operate under the same system, they are different. 
They have different cultural elements to it, different systemic elements, which are really important to try to make this the bread and butter of policing. So in these first few slides, I'm going to go through um, the findings. We're going to do this slightly the other way around and how we got there. And then Michelle's going to talk about the, the implementation side, which is, the real, I think, the really interesting side. We, if we know this works, the question becomes, how do we do it? How do we make sure we're doing it? So I'm going to show you a few graphs, but I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to put this one up a couple of times to, to, to emphasize the message, because this one, I think, tells the majority of the story. In Bedfordshire, we ran a randomised control trial under this banner of Operation Rowan. Same as in Southend, we did it for 90 days. And, and what we were able to discern was that on the days when uh, patrols were under, undertaken in hotspot areas, violence went down, harm went down, and there was less instance of, of violent crimes. And this graph shows you on the left-hand side, the first bar, the percentage of days when we didn't do a patrol, we had... 11% of those days with violent crime happening on average on the street. We saw no real effect on the first day that we sent the patrols out, but when they went out for the second, third and fourth consecutive days in a row, they really started to bite. The effect really started to take place. By that fourth day of consecutive patrolling in a violent crime hotspot, there were no crimes happening on those days, no street violent crimes. So really stark, clear pattern of this cumulative effect, you know, you take your vitamins every day, the illness stays away. A um, little context on Bedfordshire, for those uh, not familiar, um, Bedfordshire is one of the 18 forces uh, awarded the sur surge funding um, because of, of high incidence of knife injuries presenting in, in hospitals. We identified 21 hotspots, and that accounted for about 40% of all violence, and we asked this really simple question, you know, can 15 minutes of foot-based patrol, has to be on foot, walking around the hotspot, reduce violence in those 21. So this is Bedford, uh, one of the two bigger conurbations in um, Bedfordshire, along with Luton. Um, we, we put some, uh, those are some illustrations of the hotspots that we identified in Bedford. Now the thing I will draw your attention to straight away is they are much bigger than the ones that Lewis had in South End. And, and this is a really important distinction, particularly for Shire forces to take away, because it, this doesn't have to be just an inner city initiative. This can work in larger areas, as I will show you. What we did with these was um, we shuffled them in the randomised control trial pattern between a patrol condition and a no patrol condition. So for each day of this experiment, we hit a randomised button and we shuffled those different hotspots into those two different conditions. We sent patrols to uh, those that were assigned to patrol and we were very clear that we didn't want patrols to happen, specifically task patrols to happen in those that didn't. doesn't mean that police officers couldn't go into those areas, they inevitably did, but we didn't send our extra assignment into them. We then hit the same button on, on day two, shuffled them into a different order and so on and so forth for 90 days. We did this for three months throughout the, throughout I think was mostly a lockdown, lockdown period. Um, the reason we do that is we want to compare each hotspot to itself. So obviously the, the, part, the hotspot I showed you in the north of Bedford, which has got a big park in it, it's very different to one in the south of Bedford, which is around the hospital, which is very different to one in the centre of Bedford, which has got a big shopping district in. Comparing those to each other, we can't rule out other potential influences on violent crime. So we want to compare violent crime within each hotspot. We're just comparing the days where we put the patrols in versus the days where we didn't put the patrols in. If we do that enough times, over 90 days, then we can control for pretty much everything. The only thing that's different is that we put patrols in on some days and we didn't on others. What we did then was we looked at the number of days with a crime, as I've already shown you, the number of crimes, and as Lewis did, the level of crime harm using the Cambridge Crime Harm Index. And we looked at violent crimes on the street, so we, we discounted domestic crimes. Uh, we looked at non-violent crimes against victims, and then we separated out crimes that the police discovered. So they, they were, uh, required a police officer to be there and identify that the crime had happened, which is a potential byproduct of sending uh, cops into a hotspot. As I said, as I started out, the effect of the, the, the 
cumulative effect of sending patrols in consistently, one day, two days, three days, four days, was, was substantial. We, by that fourth day, we had eliminated violence in those hotspots, which really emphasises the importance of keeping this up, um, not making it a, an add-on to the additional role. This has got to be the bread and butter of policing. If it's going to have the, the, the maximum effect, it needs to be sustained. Um, a few other charts, if you'll indulge me, because um, this, uh, this is my hobby and I like to put charts in presentations to confuse people. Um, for violent crime, not only did we see less days with, with crime on, but we saw 27% fewer crimes in those patrol locations on the day that we sent them in, and 44% less harm. So why is that important? Well, it's very similar to what Lewis showed you, but in areas that are much bigger as I will tell you uh, in a minute. And South End is very different to Bedfordshire for, with, for lots of different reasons. So you're seeing a consistent effect from a very simple policing tactic when it's applied. For non-violent victim-based crimes, things like theft, uh, burglary, uh, criminal damage, we saw 23% fewer crimes and we saw 39% less harm. So this is not just violent crime that this is having a benefit on, which makes complete sense because the whole, the whole theory behind this working is uniform presence deters somebody from doing something bad. No reason why that should just happen, uh, that should just impact on violence. It, it, we, as we can show, it impacts on, on more crime types than that. And, and this, I think, is a, a very um, interesting take. Um, when we take out drugs offences, we take out public order offences, we take out possession of a weapon offences which might come as the product of a stop and search, offences which require a police officer to take proactive action to generate the crime, we might say those are, those are not crimes necessarily we want to reduce, at least in the short term. We want to drive those up because those in themselves are going to have a deterrent effect. So we separated those out as part of Operation Rowan and had a look at what was going on there. We found, in terms of the actual prevalence of them, how often these were happening, there was really not a great deal of difference, which kind of tells us that those officers are going in and doing similar, similar things. They weren't necessarily um, stopping people at a greater rate. But in terms of the severity of the crimes that they generated when, they were, when the extra patrols were sent in, they were much more serious crimes, 143% more serious, which is an interest, interesting pattern that bears uh, merit for further replications in the future to understand what's going on there. But it hints at uh, a net benefit from sending those officers in, not just in crime reduction, but in identifying more serious offences when they're in the hotspots. My last bit, and then you get to hear the, the really interesting stuff from Michelle. Um, as I've said, these hotspots were bigger. On average, they were, they were two kilometres by two kilometres, so at ten times the size of the ones in Perth or the ones in South End. Um, we didn't ask officers to do any more than 15 minutes, we, so they weren't getting to all of the hotspots. We isolated key streets where uh, previous crimes, we knew that crimes had happened previously. Um, they were sent out on a late shift because that was the sort of cluster time, but officers could go where they wanted to within that hotspot using their own, their own house. We then drew a, a, a 100 metre buffer around those areas just to check, well, were, were we pushing crime around the corner? We found no effect of that. Um, and um, at the end of all of that, the upshot is I think we've got quite a conclu another conclusive picture of the effectiveness of hotspots as a tactic. However, saying that hotspots policing is effective and doing hotspot policing is a completely different ball game. Um, and Michelle, will tell you all about the implementation challenges that we faced. Thank you. Um, so as Matt said, uh, we obviously ran an RCT, and that was part of my thesis. But my thesis focused on the implementation, not necessarily the results of the hotspot. Um, it says they're around a hotspot alarm system, because essentially the vision is to get this into business as usual. As it has been mentioned, hotspots has been around for ages, but we don't use it. We are lucky enough to have had some surge funding, but we can't rely on that. We need to build this into business as usual so it goes forward. So the vision is to have some kind of IT system where we can feed in the hotspots and essentially monitor where our officers are on a daily basis, identify um, how often they've been there, whether they've been on foot, and be able to task them to go to those hotspots. Um, 
it did factor in the importance of doing the tests because we were looking originally at some of the science around residual deterrence and that you would only need to go every four days. But as Matt has just said, we've proved that that doesn't necessarily work. So it kind of proved that we needed to do the RCT to feed that kind of science. So essentially, um, we looked at and we didn't get 98%. We got 57% compliance. We had our local policing officers do it and we had all kinds of issues that I will talk about. But essentially, we only had 57% of people do the full 15 minutes. It did rise to 68% where they did 5 to 15. So either they got diverted or went and didn't walk around for quite long enough or they might have walked just outside. Um, and they did go into the control areas 3% of the time. But this is also really useful because it shows that you don't necessarily need 98%. We only got 57% compliance and still managed to reduce crime by a quarter. I'll float over this, but essentially my thesis methodology was a participant observer case study. So essentially while we were implementing, I recorded everything. Meetings, emails, everything was kept. And then what I did is looked at everything and try and identify the key issues and the things that worked that we could use to try and inform future learning and build this into business as usual. I managed to split those into kind of key themes. COVID is one that you will see running throughout it because that obviously caused some issues. But other than that, technology, people and processes. One of our biggest issues was technology. As has been mentioned, and a lot of our evidence-based policing, technology will enable us to, to deliver this and make this easier and bring this into business as usual. Our ICT function did not have capacity to support us. We were originally going to use radio data and um, we couldn't. Well, they did not have the capacity to get that data out. In the short term, we use GPS trackers standalone for the trial, but long term, that will not be a suitable priority. IT, at the time, we're trying to mobilise most of our force to work remotely, so there are a lot of issues, but they are also dealing on the day-to-day -day basis of keeping the force running and dealing with a lot of national programmes like the rollout of Office 365. And we need to understand that um, all of these projects, we will need some kind of ICT capacity, even if it's just to enable us to put something on the officers' phones. Um, the other thing that came up is there was 18 surge funded forces and all 18 of us were all independently looking at solutions for this. We were all looking at how we use our radio data, whether we could use standalone GPS solutions. So essentially we have tried to start working together. So at least those forces that have got similar systems um, are working together and taking the pressure off these IT functions because essentially if we can build something someone else can implement, happy days and that takes the pressure off. Second area is around people. I've already mentioned we didn't get 100% compliance. Resource capacity was an issue. We did start the RCT twice because the first time we used our neighbourhood policing function and we just could not get compliance up. Many times I heard the phrase, phrase how difficult can it be to get someone to walk around for 15 minutes? Turns out more difficult than you'd expect. Um, some of the issues we need to look at is things like shift patterns. Our community have a lot of partnership meetings, so they had limited people on late shifts, which is when serious violence was happening. We wanted the patrols to happen. Similar to response when we got them to do it. Yes, they have some proactive capability, but not necessarily at kind of 4 to 8 p.m., because that is when most of our incidents are. So not only do we need to look at who we're going to use, but we need to realistically look at when they've got capacity. Another interesting thing that came up is overtime. We did offer it out. We had one person take us up on it. Um, essentially, we didn't push it. We decided we weren't going to instruct anyone to work. And again, COVID may have been an issue because people had issues with childcare. Um, they might not be able to take it. But essentially, our officers are tired. Our officers are doing a lot of overtime to do business as usual. So we can't just rely on overtime to do these things. We need to build it into business as usual. Leadership was key essentially to get the patrols done there are a number of priorities and ultimately i think one of the things that got it done was making the chief inspectors um, responsible um, to resp reply to the acc daily as to whether they've been done that does usually work with uh, getting things moving forward and finally it was around learning unfortunately we had a, our whole local policing doing this we have a lot of new students and they don't understand evidence-based policing one officer did email me and tell me that every officer we put on this operation was one less keeping Bedfordshire safe. Um, um, and we couldn't train everyone individually. So I think one of the things going forward we need to do is embed the learning of evidence-based policing, try and get people to understand why we're doing this and the benefits of it. 
And finally, processes that feed everything probably that I've just talked about. Um, briefing was an issue. It had to all be done on email, mainly because of COVID, because we couldn't go in and speak to people. Um, so we had over 300 officers doing this based on an email briefing. Um, a lot of the new officers didn't understand proactive policing. We got feedback from the sergeant saying, when we've asked them to go out and walk around and be proactive 15 minutes, they didn't really know what to do. This isn't all of them, but a lot of the new ones have been so reactive for so long, they just weren't comfortable with the opportunity to just go out and be proactive. And also a lot of our force um, systems don't help with partnership working. Uh, we were obviously working with the Cambridge Centre and um, things like information management, data sharing, HR, procurement, it all delays our ability to put these things in, um, especially in COVID hit halfway through so Matt couldn't get onto the building anymore so then we had to fill in full DPIAs and things like that to be able to just send him the data. So that is a very whistle-stop tour of some of the key issues, there's loads. But essentially, hopefully, they will help us build into our policies so that when we do this next time, we've got better understanding. We've done the DPI up first. We've got all those information so that we can share information more frequently. We've started doing briefings with officers so that when it comes up, it's not new to them. They understand. And what next? So essentially, we're going to run Operation Rowan 2. Um, we were aware that the first one was during COVID. It was also over the winter. Um, so we are going to run it again from August to February, hopefully, um, to see if that makes any difference um, so that we can then essentially build our findings into the tool and our process going forward. Uh, we're also going to have an ethnographic researcher to try and understand if there is any blocks with officers around why they don't want to do hotspot policing, what we can do to train them better, how we get messages better out to the front line. And we're also going to look at resource types. So essentially what we're going to do is uh, look at split our um, hotspots up further and use armed policing specifically in some of them. So we will have uh, local policing PCs policing some of the, the experiment sites and armed policing units to identify if the presence of APU makes any difference. So again, when we're looking forward to business as usual, what resources should we use and when should we use them? So I hope um, those two talks sort of conveyed the amount of hard work uh, and deep thought that have gone into both of those experiments. Um, we literally, I think, have, have about two minutes left. And I'm, I'm going to be um, a little bit cheeky, perhaps, because um, it's great when a minister comes to talk. It's even better when a minister stays to listen. I wonder, could, could I tempt you just to perhaps give a quick final reflection on what you've heard? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I mean, look, they're, they're both obviously fascinating. And there are another examples where people have tried to put this in place. The thing that I find astonishing is, is how hard it is to, as you quite rightly said, how difficult is it to get people to, to do this? And I suppose the key thing from my point of view is that and what I'm trying to do through the GRIP funding and the reason for the change in name from search to GRIP was to try and give that sense of, of geographic GRIP is to embed it amongst police leaders at the top who make this decision, because the one thing I have learned over the years about uh, policing is that if the chief constable says do this, it happens. Um, and the further down the chain of command you go, the more diffuse that lever and that ability to make the thing happen becomes. But the critical thing from my point of view, and I know you've, this is a course about evidence-based policing, and is there any other type, but right, that's worth it. But the key is the evidence is so compelling and now the international evidence is so compelling from, and if you haven't read it, read the book, Thomas App's book, Bleeding Out, right? Again and again and again and again, we see the value of hotspot policing, and yet it's never sustained. And so from my point of view, I don't know about you, but the key lesson for me is, first of all, when I come to Chief's Council, um, um, when I'm invited um, to embed this again and again and again, I have to be persistent in this social geographic uh, grip. And then critically, that is, is sustained through changes in leadership, through changes in rank structure, through changes in personnel, that you know, the people who are putting these projects in place will move on, get promoted to exciting things, is that the successors that come along see it as business as usual, and then it becomes embedded just as, as part of the architecture. Because what you both said, <clears throat> and what Commander Murray, Alex Murray has said again and again is, policing talks about hotspots all the time, but never does it on a sustained basis, and yet the evidence is so compelling. It, just goes without 
I, it's one of those things, you know, you look at it in life and think, why haven't we been doing this all the time? Um, and I think it will pay enormous dividends. The, the other interesting thing for me is about the nature of a hotspot, just coming out of the two presentations, right? Because, you know, obviously Essex South End was very small, and then we've got a bit bigger in Bedfordshire, and there comes a point at which you say, well, is there an optimal size? How big can it be before you start to lose some of the effect? Um, and the challenge is, you know, to keep that sharp focus, I think, rather than just say, well, we need these streets and these streets and get bigger and bigger and then you lose the impact. But I think persistence, leadership and embedding it as business as usual seems to be the lesson from today. Thanks. We're really lucky this morning. Um, you've, you've had a police minister and, and it was a great warm-up act for Neil. Um, he, here we are uh, in a seat of learning, one of the most prestigious seats of learning in the world. And in this seat of learning today, we have somebody, one of the hottest seats in policing anywhere, reflecting on learning. I think that's a, you know, a great privilege and hopefully lots of insights for us. When he was appointed, uh, Cressida Dick said some very nice things about um, his courage and his integrity and compassion. I would add curiosity. It's, this isn't a one-off where somebody turns up for a gig. Um, Neil has sent a number of students here, and he's um, been very supportive of them, whether they're looking at the legitimacy of handling complaints in CT on one end, or how they target their resources when there are lots of targets and finite resources. He's got so much to be proud of that it would take a long time, and I want you to hear him you know, if you think of the big events from Manchester in 2017, you know, to things we, we all kind of must notice, Salisbury 2018, you, you think Fishmongers Hall 2019, Streatham 2020, all on, he's, he's been involved in overseeing or directing them, those events. He's probably even prouder though of all the things that have been filed. Um, and I'll just finish by saying something he's very, very proud of that I know because he said it on more than one occasion, is that he leads an area of policing which prides itself in constantly learning and re-examining what it's doing to try and do it better. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Dassault. I still have to pinch myself slightly that I'm on a stage with Sir Dennis O'Connor. I first worked for him as a sergeant on the Lawrence Inquiry team. So, um, yeah, some few years ago. And there are the other great luminaries in this audience, I saw Sarah earlier on. Um, Simon, Vice Chair of uh, the Counterterrorism Coordination Committee, please be gentle on this speech. Uh, and also, I'm not, um, I have to apologize. And firstly, say thank you to Larry for inviting me to do this. It is a massive privilege in this great seat of learning. Um, unlike my illustrious predecessor, who was a Cambridge man, and my current successor, who was an Oxford man, the only chance of me getting into Oxbridge was as a burglar or as an assistant commissioner. So I'm, I'm pleased I've taken the, the latter route. Uh, and uh, my apologies, I'm not an academic. Uh, I'm not a criminologist, but I do happen to live with one. Uh, and having listened to Kit and talked to him afterwards, if you put everything Kit was saying in 2021 and what my wife wrote in 2004 in the British Journal of Criminology, uh, which was called Intelligence-Led Policing, Please, if you haven't read it, read it, even as an experienced cop, it will open your eyes as to what we were talking about in 2004. How odd that 2021, we're still having very similar conversations. And I think it's because we don't listen to academics, we don't learn, we don't, I'm being awful about my generation of cops here, but strangely enough, I don't want you to be that generation, which is why, as Dennis said, I sponsor people to come on this, because I want you to learn uh, and not repeat mistakes. Now that's rich coming from me. So I came into counterterrorism six years ago on promotion as a Deputy Assistant Commissioner. And I was quite proud of that. That felt like a big deal to me, Deputy Assistant Commissioner. Uh, my youngest, Joshua, said to me, Dad, Deputy and Assistant in one job title. You used to be a commander, that was cool. And my wife, Nina, she didn't miss a trick, and she said, don't forget, you were a Deputy Assistant to an Assistant to a Deputy. So for those of you who are not in London, we may be slightly overranked. I was pretty crushed, but my feet were firmly back on the floor. 
So we fast forward three years, and in March 2018, I become the Assistant Commissioner for Specialist Operations. I'm now the national lead for counterterrorism. And Joshua comes around to my house, and he gives me a massive hug. He says, Dad, we're incredibly proud of you. Assistant Commissioner of Specialist Operations, national lead for CT. That is an incredibly big deal. We are so massively proud. And then he loped off to the gym to get even bigger. And I'm not ashamed to say this. I don't know how many parents are in the audience, but who would not want to win the respect and admiration of their youngest child? I mean, he left me in tears. And about two minutes later, my phone pings, and I look down, and it's a WhatsApp. And it's Joshua, still an assistant. <laughs> now, why do I, I say this to you in all seriousness? Because actually, it's a little bit about humility and staying humble. And nothing has been more humbling than my last six years in counterterrorism. So today's talk is about learning from the past in order to fight the threats that we are seeing emerging in the future. I'm not a religious man, but I hope if there's a heaven, I hope the clothes are Italian. That might be a bit too soon for some of you, sorry. The cars are German, the food is a combination of French and Asian, but I hope my local police officer is British. And I say that because it is the most widely admired and exported policing model in the world. We have almost 200 years of policing with consent, not force, and I'm incredibly proud of it. But in 2017, something awful happened. The most photographed image of the British cop wasn't this lovely bucolic photo of PC Dixon. It was this. So what can I say about this? This talk is about lessons but also learning how to learn those lessons in a very complex environment. And remember that there's no value in identifying lessons you can't implement because it's impossible, because it's unlawful, because, because it's impractical or very timely, because it lacks political or public support. And the past six years have been the fastest evolution and diversification of threat in living memory. From the emergence of ISIS, I'll call it Daesh from now on, and their sophisticated media strategy to exploit the most vulnerable people in communities, to the rise of extreme right-wing terrorism and single-issue terrorism, and of course, increasing hostile state activity typified most by the Salisbury poisonings. I've been at the center of that CT machine since 2015, and I want to share some of the themes that might help future-proof the machine. They're global problems. None of them have an easy solution. I promise you we are working very hard on all of these. And the language of learning can be very neutral. So remember that a CT lesson often means terrible tragedy. I was very struck by Kit talking about individual events. This talk is the result of looking very hard at ourselves when we were found wanting. The reality of spending any meaningful amount of time in terrorism is that people will die on your watch. And it's for that reason we try to learn and develop our systems at the same time as fighting the good fight. And in six years, there have been 500 recommendations from multiple reviews, not least the 2017 attacks, so-called Operational Improvement Review. I chaired that with the director from V9 from Northern Ireland from MI5. CTP and MI5 did that to ourselves, commissioned by Cressida Dick and Andrew, now Lord Andrew Parker, who was head of MI5 at the time. It was not the Anderson report, as it has been labeled. This was not the government asking us to review ourselves because we couldn't break the momentum of CT. This was CT and MI5 saying, we have to look hard at what we are not doing right so that we stop there being more victims. I described it in front of Hask as trying to fine tune a Formula One car while it's still on the track setting lap records, but we knew we had to do it. And please don't underestimate the physical and emotional effort of doing that. And there are common themes. Cells of well-trained terrorists and sophisticated attack planning is still a problem, but it is not the problem of today. Now it's vulnerable young minds and contagious ideas thrown together in what I would describe as a permissive environment. You do not need to be a traditional terrorist to commit an act of terror. A twisted ideology, a cheap blunt tool, and some people to murder is all you require. It's that simple. And ironically, it's that simplicity that makes it very complex. Online radicalization has produced terrorism that is individual, dispersed, highly random, and more ideologically agnostic. It's high volume risk that's an acute threat, but it has become a chronic disease in this country. And this talk touches on the four pillars of the UK's CT strategy called CONTEST. For those who are not CT professionals, 
These four pillars, or the four Ps as they're known, are pursue, finding and stopping terrorists, protect, target hardening our most important sites and people, prepare so that we can respond and recover from an attack, and prevent stopping people becoming terrorists in the first place. So, the job I was doing, AXO, leads the CT effort in London and the UK policing response to the contest strategy through the Counterterrorism Policing Network. And that network works in lockstep with MI5, who hold the lead for UK domestic security. And this partnership, since 2017, has dealt with 12 attacks in the last four years. But it has prevented 29 more. And when I say prevented or disrupted terrorist attacks, we obviously disrupt hundreds of terrorists all of the time. Those 29 attacks were attacks designed to maim and kill. This role is a privilege. It has been called the toughest job in policing, I have to say. I think that's the Commissioner's dubious honour. But given the last six years have been the most demanding in our CT history, I think it runs a close second. So let's have a look at the threat. I've been EXO since March 2018, um, in CT policing through the rise of ISIS and extreme right-wing terrorism and the hostile state action of Salisbury. And in 2017, I was the senior national coordinator for Pursue. That has a very long job description. Any of you who know Dean Hayden will notice that he's aged dramatically since he took over from me. But it does boil down to one simple sentence, work with MI5 and stop terrorist attacks. And on my watch, 36 people died that year. And I think about those victims every day. And I say that very publicly. I probably always will. I took this job to try and stop there being any more. But nevertheless, they came. 2017 did see an overhaul of the counterterrorism system and counterterrorism laws. And I recognize the success of those hard learned lessons, but it has not been enough. Four years on, we are still in a very difficult place. And the move to very simple methodology by terrorists with little or no training required and the growth in encrypted communications post Snowden have really frustrated us. And that means the UK is in a consistently high risk position. Islamist terrorism is still the highest volume by far, but there is a smaller and significant threat from extreme right-wing terrorism, which none of us can say with any kind of evidential proof given the building we're standing here, but looks like it's continuing to grow. You see this quote from Andrew who was describing um, the threat he was facing, but in an unguarded moment, he won't mind me saying this, Outside the then new Home Secretary's office, Sajid Javid, he turned to me and said it was the worst he had seen in 34 years of countering terrorism. So what did that attack line, timeline look like? By the way, you'll get a copy of everything I'm saying to you and these slides, so please don't feel you have to scribble notes. There were eight years between the 7-7 bombings and the attacks at Bar Tiger Tiger in Glasgow from the murder of Lee Rigby in 2013. Eight years, and then four more years until Khalid Massoud hit Westminster Bridge in March 2017. And since those five attacks of 2017, there would have been two Islamist attacks in 2018 in London and in Manchester. No one was killed, thankfully. Two attacks in 2019, the Christchurch-inspired right-wing attack in Surrey, another attempted murder, and the Islamist attack in Fishmongers Hall, where two youngsters were murdered. 2020 saw three more Islamist attacks. The first two, attempted murders in Streatham High Road and Her Majesty's Prison Whitemore. The latter involved attacks on prison officers. The former resulted in the subject, who was under surveillance, being shot to death by police but not before he'd managed to wound and traumatize innocent members of the public. The third attack in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, was Reading, where again in seconds an Islamist murdered three men before being arrested. He'll never be released. His victims' families have also been handed a whole life sentence. And what did this mean for demand? Since 2017, we've disrupted 29 plots, as I've said. 10 of those have been extreme right-wing terrorism plots. One of those was an involuntary celibate plot, misogynists, effectively, who wanted to murder women. And the remaining were Islamist plots. And those high volumes continue. Over 850 live investigations, which is a 30% plus increase on 2017, and about between 2,500 and 3,000 at any one time acute subjects of interest who remain a national security threat. And on top of that, there are many, many tens of thousands of subjects who are now what we call closed, which means they were once the subject of a national security investigation. 
Some of them may well be dead. Some of them may well have been innocent when they were looked at. Many of them were not. And like Westminster, Manchester, Fishmongers Hall, and Streatham, some of them may yet return to attack. And the context of that threat is changing fast. With the pandemic, millions of deaths, and an uncertain financial future. And in the USA, we saw an attempted insurrection at the heart of a global democracy in Washington, DC. And those concerns were hitting us when we had not yet fully taken stock of the lessons of 2017 to 2020. We had some very difficult messages from the Westminster London Bridge and most recently the Fishmongers Hall inquest. The Manchester public inquiry is still part heard and difficult revelations there are being broadcast every day. Streatham and Salisbury, those inquests are yet to start. And as we look back to ensure lessons are learned, an expression everybody hates, I assure you, we must look forward to understand emerging threats and we need to secure ourselves online and in the real world. And to do that, you also have to land the right balance between target hardening and securitization of our entire society. I'm often asked if I can make us 100% safe. The government has a zero tolerance for terrorist attacks. There are ways to do that, but you would be living in a country I suggest you would not want to live in anymore. Themes. So over four years, the lessons learned over 500 recommendations for CT policing MI5 and our partners. You'll be pleased to know I'm not going to take you through every one of those, but I am going to talk to you about eight very clear themes by my reckoning. And the first is how we collect, analyze, and use data. You're on an evidence-based policing course. And then importantly, how we share it in the national security machine with outside partners who could hold the vital key to stopping an attack. Every single inquest or inquiry I've ever been involved in, including the um, uh, serious crime reviews that Kit was talking about, will at some point point to a failure of communication between two agencies. We are no different. And these days, the clue to stopping a terrorist might actually be found in a doctor or a social worker or a teacher's report rather than in the national security databases. So the second theme has to be that partnership and mobilizing not just national security partners, but the business community and the public in a whole society response. Not least the need for people to be alert to the reconnaissance, the planning, the renting, and the purchasing of material by terrorists, who are sometimes the most unremarkable figures. But with hindsight, we're leaving clues to their intent that collectively we just didn't see. The third theme was the scourge of extreme right-wing terrorism. I've mentioned it twice already. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that I was born in 1968, one year after the National Front was born in this country, and they plagued my upbringing. What a fantastic opportunity that I never thought I would have to break similar organizations in the future. And National Action, which was prescribed in 2016, is a broken organization because we paid attention to what was happening with extreme right-wing terrorism when nobody else was, including MI5. Nobody appreciated the threat it was, and it was not being dealt with in the same way as Islamist terrorism. We fight terrorists. It shouldn't matter what their ideology is. If they want to commit a terrorist offense, we should be using all of our tools. The fourth theme, the failure to adequately protect crowded spaces. Lots of them have multiple owners, but very few of those owners have any sense of shared responsibility for that space and the people who come to inhabit it. The fifth theme, the lack of responsibility by social media giants and the online harm that the volume and speed of radicalizing material was and is causing. Sixth, the lack of attention to the committed terrorist once convicted, radicalizing others from inside prison cells, hence the attempted murders on prison officers that have happened in the last few years, and still committed to murder on their release, the Fishmongers Hall example, the Streatham High Road example. Seventh, this threat is no longer mainly trained and directed from abroad, but it's mostly caused by inspiring local, mostly younger boys and men through social media. And lastly, my eighth theme, I just used the word younger. So, it's the phenomenon of the teenage terrorists. Our youngest target so far is 13 years old. There are a number of 13-year-olds now. Often these are mixed up kids unable to choose between violent ideologies and with very complex psychological needs. 
We have a major social problem brewing in our homes and on the web, and COVID lockdown, I guarantee, will have made that worse. And those eight themes distill the essence of what 12 attacks and 29 disruptions has taught me over the last four years. It runs across all four CT pillars and all sections of society, and it's not exhaustive. Failures across those themes conflate to increase the risk of extremism, the key driver behind terrorist acts. I will concentrate on four things that seem most pressing to me today. The protect duty, the changing nature or typology of the terrorists, online harm, and the prevent program. So the protect duty. Sir John Saunders, the, uh, uh, the judge who's chairing Manchester uh, Public Inquiry in volume one of his findings in that public inquiry has stressed the need for this, which we have supported. I was being interviewed for her thesis by Fegan Murray, the mother of Martin Hett. The protect duty started off as Martin's law and by the actions of one bereaved mother. Complex problems need sophisticated solutions. Contest, the government's strategy is a multifaceted program. It's uh, why we seek to deliver all of its elements in partnership. And the 2017 reviews emphasized that we couldn't do it alone, that partnership piece I talked about. The responsibility for stopping terrorism cannot rest with the national security machine alone. It needs local government, it needs wider law enforcement, it needs businesses, it needs communities, and most of all, it needs active citizen support. And we learned that the softest terrorist target is a publicly accessible place. Not an iconic place. Streatham High Road shows us that. We changed the definition. We had been concentrating on iconic places. But when you change the definition to a publicly accessible place, all of a sudden the United Kingdom goes from around 600 places to 625,000. How on earth do you protect those? Most of them simply can't be protect protected by intrusive security measures. And as we target hard on the obvious iconic venues, which are still a huge target for terrorists, we do push terrorists to look elsewhere for any crowd. Fishmongers Hall, Streatham High Road, a Stanwell car park, a Reading public garden. They were simple attacks in public places that had no security. And to counter that kind of threat, we need partnerships with local authorities, businesses, and major events organizers, so they have to put in place appropriate CT measures. And to provide such security consistently and at scale, we need a legal framework placing more responsibilities on owners and administrators of those potential targets. The government's just finished its consultation on the protect duty. It'll be very interesting to see what the response has been. It seeks to improve protective security and organizational preparedness in a proportionate way. It's right to require those responsible owners to keep the public safe but it needs to be a proportionate and collaborative effort and not a legal sledgehammer. Change at this scale is only going to work by having a shared ambition to prevent there being more victims and survivors of terrorism. And good security doesn't need to mean costly security measures. For many, it's simply staff training using products we've already made freely available online. The security community will make sure that taking up CT guidance is cheap easy and intuitive. We've worked incredibly hard to provide online tools that can be used at scale, massively accelerated by COVID. Our strapline Action Counters Terrorism has been deployed to brand a suite of those online tools, and in as little as 45 minutes, staff can have the knowledge and confidence to spot and report suspicious behavior, to understand what to do if they're attacked, and how to make a plan. These are incredibly simple measures that could be the difference between life and death. I've got 29 years in policing. I've watched that 45 minutes. I learned something. This is important stuff. And we now have 10,000 organizations registered for this learning. Over 600,000 learners have already completed 2 million modules of that training, and it's growing. So the second big pressing need, this is the changing typology of the terrorist. The methodology has changed but so has the nature of the terrorists. They are no longer the ones we were fighting post 9-11. The rise of the lone actor terrorist, as they were called, should now be our first concern. But it's an inaccurate description. Uh, it was recently changed by the government to self-initiated terrorist. It's gonna take some while to catch on in the media, I think. And the reality is they may carry out the final act alone, 
but they seldom arise from a vacuum. They've usually spoken to someone in advance or telegraphed their intentions. And often, they're the violent end product of an online or offline radicalizer. There are opportunities to intervene. Lone Actor implied that they were impossible to predict, see, or stop. That they never used propaganda or told others about their plans, and that's just not true. They are very hard to see and stop, but they are not impossible. The dispersal of Daesh, defeated militarily, has reduced but not eradicated their online influence. And their tactics are now being copied by actors on the extreme right, who are also very skilled online. And we're beginning to understand the difference between the self-initiated terrorist and terrorist cells. Their ideological position and consistency is different with the former being much more volatile, much shallower, and much more unpredictable. They're less likely to be seen by us and more likely to be known to close contacts. contacts. Hence the doctor, social worker, the family, the friend, the work colleague. But they might not recognize the danger until it's too late. And at the heart of this shallow, ideologically mixed up terrorist is often an individual with complex needs and a whole range of vulnerabilities. And like a patient suffering from comorbidities, improved outcomes require complex clinical management. There is no single easy intervention. And I draw analogies with what Kit was saying about gangland violence and adverse childhood experiences. So lengthy prison sentences do have their place, but we know how extremism can flourish in prisons. Mental health treatment can play a part, but we can be very dependent on its efficacy for a person who is living in chaos. Addictions, poverty, poor health, education, employment, and structure all combine to drive feelings of isolation, exclusion, anger, and potentially violence. People in those circumstances are incredibly easy prey for radicalizers. I talked about the protect duty being a responsibility to protect vulnerable public spaces. We should apply exactly the same effort to protecting vulnerable minds, and that needs a comorbidity approach to vulnerable people, to be able to spot them early and to give them the tools they need to build structure and resilience in their lives. I'm not downhearted. Self-initiated terrorists can escalate to action quickly, but a shallow ideology is easier to break if we act early, and the intervention provider is skilled. That was Kit's point about amateurism in this area. Once caught up in the radicalization cycle, we're on the back foot. Worse if they're already mobilizing to action. And sharing sensitive information across agencies with different levels of vetting adds to that complication. But there are solutions to that. By sharing intelligence with a wide range of partners to deliver multiple interventions to better manage risk. Bear in mind this is a community that for decades has not seen fit to share top secret intelligence with anybody. Until post 7-7, they rarely shared it with policing, including counter-terrorist police. The partner's role is to collectively understand the risks posed by subjects referred to them by MI5 and counter-terrorism policing. And the diversity of that partnership improves the range of interventions you can bring to bear. And the frontline partners, the local authorities, the health, the education, the employment, they're no longer distanced from the information they need to make effective decisions and provide better support. The MAC solved the problem of moving sensitive, nationally held information into local partners lawfully. And I heard earlier on about the difficulties we still have sharing information with health. That is absolutely replicated in the CT arena. And if it sounds easy that MAC managed to do that, then you've never written a data sharing agreement. And even if you have, I bet you've never written it between a doctor and a spy. Multi-agency interventions across the radicalization and terrorist life cycle is not learning from the past. It is anticipating future challenge. After 2017, we needed to make the management of terrorist suspects more explicit and more consistent. And we started a project called SEMPA as a result. And SEMPA will be a national service for the overt management of subjects to protect the public. The aim is sustained disengagement from extremism. UK policing is really familiar with criminal offender management, with mature multi-agency partnerships. CT nominal management is exactly the same thing, except not all of our subjects have been convicted. It's about managing the risk either at the start of radicalization or at any point up to and including their prison release after time served, but also potentially forever. And MAC and SEMPA are both part of a set of extrajudicial sanctions 
And they're very distinct from the PREVENT program, which I'll talk about briefly, which is voluntary and in the pre-crime space. So the third big theme is online harms. My predecessor talked about this a lot, to the point at which MI5 used to ask me if I wouldn't mind going and telling Mark to be slightly more nuanced about his approach, because unfortunately we do need these people to help us as well. Early intervention is becoming very, very challenging, with warnings less often seen in the real world that are commonly detected online. And to get ahead of the threat, you have to see it coming, and that is much, much harder today. The pandemic has increased online hateful extremism and radicalization by volume. Not necessarily criminal terrorist material, but stuff just before the, below the legal threshold. And millions of people, many young, impressionable, and lost, have been cooped up for hours browsing this stuff online. In my view, it will increase the likelihood of keyboard extremists taking those destructive fantasies into the real world, personally or through the influence of others. Every recent UK attack has had elements of online planning and radicalization, sometimes very quickly indeed. The Finsbury Park Mosque extreme right-wing terrorist was a bitter, depressed thug who was radicalized into a terrorist murderer in just weeks. You can't contextualize or plan for future threats without understanding what is currently happening online. The scale and diversity of public forums has massively changed the game for us. And it's not my place to position the boundaries of free speech, or any cops for that matter. But the context in which we consider free speech in this country has undergone a seismic change in just a decade. The opportunities to speak or write anonymously are vast. They dwarf the largest real-world platforms of public discourse. And there are great aspects to that, of course. But we also understand the risks of our anonymity in national security, the behavior it can drive in the vulnerable, and the effect of disinformation on society, selling lies, promoting paranoia, and creating risk. In 2021, I think few people would argue that online harms are not a concern. How we make online safer is much more controversial. That seems like a very simple concept, but it's set within the most complex system controlled by a powerful few people. Is a secure, safe internet that also promotes freedom of speech even achievable? No one has the right to create and share criminal content online. But how do you divide, define that boundary between lawful and unlawful discourse? Who actually gets to decide that? How do we develop online law globally when society's positions on freedom of expression differ even between culturally very similar nations? And how will a regulator enforce its will in that environment? How do providers satisfy everyone's demands? How do you negotiate with tech giants and innumerable smaller platforms? Where is the line between merely objectionable and dangerously extreme, and who decides? If you tilt too far one way, that risks unacceptable state interference. If you go too far the other way, you get the online Wild West. Some might argue that that's where we are. And for evidence of this, look no further than during COVID, the 5G conspiracy theories. Cultivated in dark corners of the internet, they rapidly moved hundreds of people to take real world action across international boundaries. Washington probably wouldn't have happened without the amplification of social media. This, where online meets reality and asks us to consider what insight and radicalization means in the information age. Those concepts are very difficult in law. But we are stretching our understanding of proximity, causation, and immediacy to extremes. Does incitement need to be directed, or can it be passive? Can radicalization be careless or reckless? Is asserting a 5G conspiracy an incitement to burn down mass or simply an objectionable opinion. And if you can't prove the author's intent, do we work backwards from the consequences? And if we do, how far do we stretch that chain of causation? Who's actually responsible? Is it the espouser of the conspiracy? Is it the interviewer? Is it the producer? Is it the platform? Is it those people who shared it? And much of the responsibility of sorting this out sits with the powerful elite only big tech has the resources to fix this, and I wouldn't want to fight them. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. He didn't invent heavy breathers. 
I have some sympathy for those social media giants. They won't believe me if they were listening. They probably are. They are in control of tools unthinkably more powerful and influential than their original invention. They have extraordinary responsibility, and we all want them to solve a problem they never previously contemplated. What I have no sympathy for is them refusing to accept the burden or to help solve it. The genie is out. It shouldn't take somebody like me to tell them it's dangerous. We don't want one of humanity's greatest inventions to become the greatest curse because we didn't cooperate to fix a social dilemma. And I accept that social media providers are not yet publishers in law, therefore they don't carry the same accountability for content. But they are receiving content and at an unfathomable scale. So only they can change how they manage it and how their users interact. But despite being in the best position to intervene, they are probably not best placed to decide what to intervene in, when or how. And the law needs to help them do that. And then providers must proactively identify and prevent serious online criminal content and support law enforcement. And they would be wise to exercise that social responsibility. Strong terms and conditions of use that they rigorously enforce. And some of them have started to do that. But can they actually be consistent? Zuckerberg's position on end-to-end -end encryption is a nightmare for organized crime and counterterrorism enforcement. In the end, deciding what is and is not acceptable online has to be a decision for society, not just a few people. And perhaps these ideas seem very obvious to you, but even if you agree with me, our approach has to be cautious and the outcomes closely monitored. We've seen past problems with legislation and policy, particularly in counterterrorism, which were intended as a scalpel and then applied as a sledgehammer, and that can lead to some very Orwellian outcomes and increased radicalization. And this problem scales astronomically, given the fact that we have billions of social media users. And I don't underestimate the challenge this industry faces, but face it, it must. And the use of media to share harmful ideological messages is well understood. This tactic has been used to devastating effect by Daesh, and we know what to look for. But other ideologies are learning from their example and can push hateful rhetoric just below the legal threshold as they fish for vulnerable minds to pull into much harder line extremism. They hide on encrypted platforms, luring in the vulnerable from the more established networks. And it's made more complex because hateful extremism as a concept is hard to pin down. We don't yet have a legal definition to enforce. And our challenge is the cliff edge between lawful but objectionable and unlawful. The CT legal thresh threshold currently creates a cliff edge where you can go from lawful to committing an offense that has a 15-year prison sentence with a couple of keystrokes. The absence of any lower level offenses means that our intervention will almost always result in a serious judicial outcome. And once you're in that serious end of the system, desistance and disengagement from extremism is far, far harder. This is a criminal justice truism. It's the reason why we want to work to keep young people out of the criminal justice system as much as possible. And don't get me wrong, police tend to celebrate a conviction, especially if we foil a plot. I don't object to that, it's part of the mission. I'm incredibly proud of the incredible skill it takes to achieve it. But there is also real sadness here. Many cases involve teenagers with issues that made them likely to be taken down this rabbit hole. There is a recent case of a kid posting bomb-making manuals on neo-Nazi forums. He's a five-star student. The two-year suspended sentence reflected both the seriousness of the case but also the mitigation required by his age and his vulnerability. He should have been about to go to this university, not a prison, and his parents were genuinely shocked. And youth, isolation, and autism seem to be common factors in radicalization and susceptibility. Once a line is crossed, it is right that we in law enforcement take action, but that should be tempered with rehabilitation to reduce the risk of creating an even harder terrorist long term. And I talk about this a lot, prevent. The environment methods and terrorist types I describe as may protect and pursue interventions more difficult. And they do feel like penalty saves. I'm sorry to do that to you again. God forbid we should miss, and the chilling fact is that we have missed, and we will miss again. I speak often about prevent publicly, the voluntary support and de-radicalization program for people becoming extremists who have not yet been convicted of an offense. It's easily the most important pillar given the threats I've described to you today. 
but it's also there to prevent online harm and radicalizers being given a platform to preach. And they are both controversial policies. They tread the fine line of censorship in a democracy where free speech is a cornerstone, but it's not an unqualified human right. There has to be freedom to speak, but not the freedom to do harm. And neither policy is as controversial as it seems as this much more benign one that Simon over there and I call prevent. You would think that the voluntary safeguarding of some of society's most vulnerable members would be less contentious. Most people have never even heard of prevent, but we have allowed a loud, unchallenged minority to label it toxic, often for their own ends. We've made it really easy for the critics as well. We failed to be open and transparent. We weren't clear about the difference between what we meant, between prevent and pursue, where our interventions were designed to protect and safeguard you, and when they were designed to penalize and prosecute you. I've always wanted to talk more about the success of prevent than the effectiveness of pursue, because prevent is about redemption, forgiveness, and second chances. Prevent doesn't ruin lives, it saves them. I'm really proud to be in a country where it thought prevent was an important policy to have. It isn't just worthy, it's essential. If we didn't have it, we'd have to invent it. Everything else I've said can be mitigated by early intervention, and the earliest intervention starts in prevent. And research tells us that somebody close to an extremist, when the radicalization cycle is gathering momentum and they're starting to mobilize to violence, knows. And it's vital that the public can recognize when that's happening and report it. But in order to report it, they have to have the confidence and trust in us to do precisely that if it's going to save lives. This is, an, uh, is the ACT Early website launched in November last year. It's a resource we're incredibly proud of. We're trying to generate that trust and confidence by being more open and transparent in what we do. It's a very simple route into prevent with a clear call to action through a dedicated advice line that is staffed by specialists. It had an immediate operational impact when it was launched, a genuine referral on day one and many more since. And any one of those referrals could be a life-saving intervention, either for the perpetrator or potentially for their victims if they're not shown a different path. And no matter how effective the other three Ps, the other three pillars of contest are, the only tr true cure is an effective prevent system driven by communities looking out for their own. When I was a murder detective, I was taught that there was no greater privilege than to investigate the death of another human being. And six years as a CT professional has taught me that that is rubbish. There is, in fact, no greater privilege than to prevent the death of another human being, of course. So, moving towards the end, I promise. Learning how to learn. Earlier, I said, simultaneously, you had to be able to look back for lessons and look forward to the emerging, emerging threat. And there are real risks in getting that wrong. We must, learn about getting st we must learn without getting stuck in fighting the last war. And then again, it's no use scanning the future horizon when the enemy is at your gates. And this is the position we found ourselves in in 2017. And organizational learning is very different to individual learning. It gets harder with scale. It's easy to get real tunnel vision when you're reviewing gaps in the system after an event. It can take resources away from engaging the most acute, clear, and present danger looking for a single, low-risk, highly improbable event, a needle in an ever bigger haystack skews your resources away from the current threat. And we can't easily look at the tens of thousands of closed subjects I described in the hope of finding one that might just return, and in doing that, ignore the 3,000 we know are actually plotting against us. A deep understanding of terrorist behavior, sophisticated triage of intelligent, intelligence fragments of information, and tripwires to alert us are required. That's going to require machine learning against unfathomable quantities of data. That is essential. And extraordinary people get up every day trying to give us a fighting chance, trying to put that together. The scrutiny of something as complex as the counterterrorism machine is a huge undertaking. And in doing that, you can paralyze iterative improvement. But recording a lesson without implementing a change is like buying a book you never read. And part of the answer is investing in a dedicated organizational development framework. Make sure the lesson is captured. Make sure it's owned by someone. Make sure it's being docked into the right cross-system of oversight and governance. That's a really easy thing to say. But it can become a massive bureaucracy concerned only with large, unwieldy projects. And we've learned that to our cost, where vital learning was never operationalized, or it was only ever applied to a very small part of the system. 
And we must be experimental, agile, reflective, and unafraid of failure, constantly testing our assumptions of best practice. The biggest decisions, those on data, science, and technology, must be carefully made and safeguards put in place to ensure such programs don't live or die on personality or political expedience. And conversely, inertia can't be a reason to continue with a project that is no longer relevant or is failing. We have to invest in solutions that are threat agnostic and can be repurposed. What do I mean by that? That applies to both technology, people, places, and training. Given the pace of change and how quickly national security sometimes needs to pivot, being able to direct teams, systems, equipment, and techniques to an entirely new problem with minimal tweaks is essential. Having the interoperability to bring in non-CT partners from major or organized crime is essential. How would I conclude? One of the themes of this talk has been about sharing. Um, and as I said, better information sharing features in every public inquiry. Another thing that's easier to say than do, uh, and it often requires regulation, expertise, management, and huge legal bills, I've noticed. But what it really needs is proper trust between partners to do it well. Now is the time to recognize that we must trust that our partners might actually know something we don't. Ironically, we're often blinded by our own expertise. The model we use to understand the world can determine what we see. Fresh minds, new perspectives, a diversity of thought is required if we are to be more than the sum of our parts and solve the most wicked problems I've shared with you today. And if we dare to share information, we must be constantly questioning what's actually working. Exercise, test, learn what works well, and then repeat. Exercise, test, learn, repeat. It bears repeating. Manchester will tell us that we failed to learn what we already knew how to do. Fishmongers has already told us that we failed to anticipate an emerging threat. Those of us charged with defending the realm will have to live with those conclusions for the rest of our lives. And they weigh very heavily, let me tell you. But in my defense, I'll leave you with a few thoughts. Firstly, the power of hindsight. I started my life in 1992 as a Lavender Hill, Lavender Hill mob cop based in Battersea, just down the road from Clapton Junction. This is a quote from Anthony Hidden QC in the aptly named Hidden Report into this Clapton Junction rail disaster in 1988. He said this, there is almost no human action or decision that cannot be made to look flawed and less sensible in the misleading light of hindsight. Uh, and this great hero of mine, who I hope is going to speak to CPD and chief officers and the strategic command course, Matthew Syed, the wonderful author of Bounce, Black Box Thinking and Rebel Ideas. If you've not read those texts, please do. They probably wouldn't pass this, um, this professor's scrutiny, but they are very readable and very worthwhile. This Olympian Matthew Syed quoted Hidden in his column on the 20th of May. And he went on to say that these words should be pinned to the door of any future inquiry and used in response to anyone who rushes to judgment on frontline professionals making decisions in complex circumstances. It is, I think, the only way to get to the truth. It is also the only way to subvert the false narratives that are threatening to harden into conventional wisdom. I'm pleased Kip's left because I was going to say I think contest is a government strategy that is entirely fit for purpose. And that isn't something you can always say about governments. I think it's four Ps and named pillars for a reason. When you take one away, the whole structure collapses. <clears throat> Without their counterparts, no single pillar will sustain the fight against terrorism and will never be able to rely too heavily on any single one. But we will lose prevent at our peril. If I've learned nothing in the last six years but one big thing, it's this. Evil does triumph when good people do nothing. It's been an enormous privilege to work alongside men and women who get up every day to do something, anything that they lawfully can, to defeat the evil we call terrorism. I salute them, we all should. Lots of uh, themes there familiar to the course um, that, that is unfolding and for those who've been through the course, an opportunity to ask the man in the hot seat questions. You talked quite a bit about information sharing, Neil, but one of the findings or one of the pub publicly known findings of the Fishmongers Hall 
inquest has been about a very serious failure of information sharing. Um, I wonder if you'd like to tell us if you think that criticism is fair, um, and if it's fair, what more can be done to ensure that information that's held by one agency makes its journey through to agencies that can act um, more effectively than happened in this case? Thanks. It's an incredibly fair question. And I spent two hours with the families just before I made the statement uh, outside the Guild Hall on Fishmongers to say that it was an entirely fair judgment, that it was an information failure to appreciate what they had and to share amongst different agencies. What's interesting about it is in the detail, which obviously came out in the court, is that the information uh, that Usman Khan was uh, wanting to return to his old ways and was planning an attack was known to both MI5 and counter-terrorism policing, was passed from MI5 to counter-terrorism policing, was passed into the system between counter-terrorism policing and special branch, and there it failed through the lack of skill or knowledge of the officers who received the information. There is no way of getting around that. Uh, it is the reason that we have Operation Semper. The terrible thing about Operation Semper is it had been deprioritized for funding one week before the Fishmongers Hall attack. So we had recognized in 2017 that the way we managed uh, convicted and released offenders was going to be a huge problem. We've arrested 1,600 and convicted 654 since 2017. And because in terrorism we arrest people early, they're not all in there for life. Lots of them are coming out. I will regularly see nine or 10 coming out across the UK. So unless we have a more professional system with more consistent training and guidance for officers who are going to have to manage them and some strong laws about uh, notification requirements and what we can and can't do, and the current bill is going to give us some of that. So very similar to sex offenders, we'll be able to um, search people's houses um, for signs of uh, re-engaging with extremism. Uh, and the only, it's almost impossible to say anything without sounding defensive, and that feels like an insult to the families. But the original intelligence that was passed, uh, and I presume everyone in this hall will know what this means when I say it, was E5. You know, in the media, it would sound like it was A1, and that it was very obvious that this man was planning an attack. It was not even obvious to the brilliant officers who were who had given judges commendations for their post-attack investigation how this person had come to decide that he was going to commit this attack. And he definitely duped lots of very professional people, as well as some young, naive individuals. But he duped a lot of very professional people as well. Um, and the original intelligence saying that you know, he, he was pretending was E5, so the very lowest standard of intelligence you could possibly have. And if we reacted to every piece of E5 intelligence with a full 24-7 surveillance operation, um, well, I, it would be obvious that we couldn't do that. So I can't go into the details, but if the public knew how many of those operations I was able to run, uh, they'd be quite shocked. By the way, that was the operation that was going on in Stratton. So that was somebody that we had much better graded intelligence and had a full 24-7 armed surveillance operation than that. Thank God. Good afternoon, boss. In um, the light of recent events um, in Afghanistan and, and the withdrawal of troops, um, I don't know if you can sort of comment on this, but um, do you think that uh, military intervention overseas has uh, a positive effect on uh, counter-terrorism policing or uh, a negative one? Wow. Yeah. There's almost no way I can answer that without getting fired. Um, well, the reality is, is it's both, because there is no doubt whatsoever that um, the attacks that were directed from war zones could not have been suppressed without military effort. So. This is a personal view, but it's kind of the war in Afghanistan was a just war. You know, there is no doubt it was the seedbed of global terrorism. It's where all the training was taking place. It's where all the funding was going. It was where bin Laden was generating hundreds of thousands of followers post 9-11. I mean, in many respects, has anyone read the book, The Black Banners? 
if you want to read about, I wish I'd read it when I started my counterterrorism career, it's absolutely brilliant. It's by an FBI agent called Ali Soufan. Ali Soufan was the only Muslim FBI agent in the whole of the United States of America. So when I talk about diverse thinking, about spotting a threat that's coming, he spotted bin Laden was a threat years before 9-11. No one would listen to him. Um, we are kind of where we are today because of that, because bin Laden had about 400 followers. Now, after two wars, he's got hundreds of thousands. And Daesh, you know, his previous um, splinter group from Al-Qaeda, uh, is now thousands strong. Despite the military defeats, they are reforming, particularly in Africa and the Far East. So the second half of the answer is, what those wars do is they do radicalize. They do radicalize, and that has become a massive problem for us because our propaganda machine isn't as effective as theirs. So where's our counter-narrative for a worldwide caliphate? Yeah, and you don't see this with extreme right-wing terrorism because there is much less of an ideological grip around the story. You know, they can't coalesce around a particular narrative. There's lots of different white supremacist and neo-Nazi and Satanist and occultist. They never seem to be able to galvanize as one single mission and they're quite often rather confusing, and that's incredibly useful. That is not the case, obviously, with Islamist, Salafist, jihadism. So we couldn't have suppressed as many threats or foiled as many plots as we did without that military intervention overseas. It provided much of the intelligence, and that's why everyone's worried now. Um, but there is no doubt that it has resulted in radicalization as well. It's a real catch-22. It's a wicked problem, and I'm pre pleased I'm not in government. Uh, good afternoon. I am the defense policy lead for PREVENT. I'm a military police officer. Um, but given our access to training and ammunition, I'd like to just um, get your thoughts on extreme right-wing terrorism. Um, how much of a risk do you think there is within defense? Because frankly, I don't know what I don't know. Um, I know we have a small number of referrals, but I don't know if that's the extent of the threat or if we're just not looking in the right places. And is there more that you think we should be doing specifically? Should we take a more structured approach to how we deal with our co-located CT colleagues? Good, good question. I'm actually incredibly, hello, nice to meet you. Uh, defense colleagues, very important to us in counterterrorism. And you have been doing great things with PREVENT where you don't need to, because you're not statutorily obliged to, and you've voluntarily picked that up. We, for those who don't know, we've had a lot of people who've traveled to war zones to fight with the YPG, who are a militia group who are fighting Daesh. Um, but of course, we have to treat every one of those as a potential threat, because anyone who's motivated, who doesn't want to become a soldier and fight for their country, just fancies going and fighting in a war zone, probably has to be looked at rather carefully. Um, and we have had unsuccessful prosecutions, because clearly, nobody really wants to prosecute somebody who was fighting one of the worst evils of our time. We have had a couple of occasions where a couple of those referrals have been serving soldiers who have returned from war zones and might be described as radicalized by their experience or on the field of combat. And that is understandable. Wouldn't be the only country going through that. Some of our other partner countries, I've seen some very disturbing things about regiments that are affected, some law enforcement agencies, including some specialist counter-terrorism law enforcement agencies in other countries affected by this. So the short answer is absolutely, we should all be doing something about it. I'm asked this question about policing and how, we, how good are we at looking in policing, particularly when I've seen what's happened in those partners. Germany is the, uh, but Austria recently as well, two very key examples. What are we doing in the uniformed services who have to deal with this problem and can become radicalized because of it? Um, we should be much more aware of the risk. So I'm always telling the public to be aware. We should be too. Neil, we could keep you here all day, but I'm gonna give one last chance to ask you a hot question. Hello, sir. Your first slide was a community policing team officer. Um, having been in CT myself, do you think the recent, fingers crossed, the recent successes of CT are due in a large part to the increase the government's made to community policing teams across the country? Uh, not yet, but I'm, like you, probably incredibly proud of our local to global strap line. And it's local to global because we're hoping that every cop is a good CT cop, and that is from the neighborhood policing officer right up to our international liaison officers 
around the globe. Uh, and that flow of intelligence, one of the things we say is that, you know, um, an officer who's walking in Bexley is only two phone calls away from an officer who's working in Kabul. Um, so our ability to sort of generate intelligence from the front line is incredibly important. But more important than that for me is not the intelligence dividend, it's the community dividend for Prevent. So it is the, the officers that are most likely to be trusted by communities who don't trust national security law enforcement are going to be turning to their neighborhood officers. And I know after 10 years of austerity, there are places in this country that have none. I mean, I'm lucky I worked in London where we managed to maintain some semblance of it, but nothing like enough. So I think it's a vital part of the, the fight, but it's a vital part of keeping any community safe. I'm ple what I worry about is us being able to educate frontline officers when they've got a whole panoply of things to concern them. Um, I remember when I was first policing Battersea, um, one of the first slides on every briefing before every tour were the rainbow slides from the anti-terrorist command, which were, I don't know, probably about 10, 12 slides before you even got to a local burglar. You know, trying to absorb that uh, as, as a young officer on the front line, very difficult. So we have to be a bit punchier about how we do it. We were very proud of the DVD we put out a couple of years ago. Got very widespread uptake, was seen by an awful lot of people. 15 minutes to learn quite a lot about the signs to spot of that extremism on your patch. We need to be continually doing and refreshing stuff like that. And I think long term, you know, if we probably somebody should have challenged Kit on the 20,000 uplift um, and what's happened in crime over the last 10 years. Surprise, surprise, Mr. Cole, you didn't. Um, but we're, we're only getting back to where we were. Um, how we use those people, who will be incredibly inexperienced, will be key for all of us, whether you're dealing with other crime types or terrorism. 